due to non, no quorum at the time of 1.30, the meeting is called off and will be reconvened at 1.45. Meeting adjourned.
Good afternoon, members of parliament, support staff, TV viewers, radio listeners, those following via social media, and members of the media. Welcome to the continuation of Central Committee meeting number 14 of today, Tuesday, March 14, 2023. I would like to give a special welcome to the Minister of Public Health, Social Development, and Labor, Mr. Omar Otley. We have established a quorum of 10 members. Please stand for a moment of silence. <laughs> Thank you. I have received notice of absence from <clears throat> the following member, MP Chanel Brownbill. Are there any other notifications? MP Christopher Emmanuel, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon to you, my colleagues, the Honorable Minister and his support staff, the people of St. Martin. Mr. Chairman, I have taken notice in the rules of order that there's no provisions in terms of bringing a motion of confidence. Because we always talk about a motion of no confidence, Mr. Chairman. And the reason why I'm asking this, so probably you can dialogue with the Rafid and find out, even though there's no provisions in the rules of order can it be tabled still during the OV where one can bring a motion of confidence instead of a motion of no confidence? Because it's been rumored that a minister is being asked to resign. He's asked to, you know, to, what? a minister is asked to resign. So I would like to know if a motion of confidence can be brought forth in support of a minister if one find that he's doing it. A good job. I'm just inquiring, seeing that there's no provisions written in the rules of order. Thank you very much. Thank you, MP Christopher Emmanuel. We'll surely look into that. I will discuss with the Grafir and get back to you on that. I see MP Sarah Westcott Williams. MP Westcott, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, as we start or in fact, it's a continuation of the meeting that we started yesterday on the budget 2023. And you would recall, Mr. Chairman, that at the closing of the meeting yesterday, the Minister of Finance asked to make some comments before you closed the meeting because he did not want a wrong impression to be created. The remarks by the Minister of Finance were that, and now I paraphrase, many members of parliament have highlighted the fact that several budget items have been cut and in some cases drastically so. The minister cautioned in his concluding remarks last night that the impression should not be created as if the government has just been cutting the budget. According to the minister, again in these remarks, it was about the it was about adjusting to the actual situation. It was about living within our means, so to speak. But Mr. Chairman, that is not really a correct assessment. And I'll give you a perfect example. The Minister of Education referred to an item that was put in the budget on the basis of a motion passed in Parliament. And that motion had to do with promoting the dance schools on St. Martin and assisting especially those youngsters who could otherwise not afford to attend dance classes. And while the Minister of Education in this case lauded that program and that project, the budget for it in 2023 has been cut. So it is not so that the cuts in the budget 2023 are because we don't need any higher budgets. That is absolutely not the case. The budget has been cut from its original budget for 2023 with 72 million guilders. 
So is the government and the Minister of Finance, based on his concluding remarks last night, saying that that 72 million was just over budgeted? So again, the premise that is being created or insinuated that in fact these cuts are all justified, I completely disagree. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Sarah Westcott Williams. I don't see Ludmila. MP Ludmila D. Weaver, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon to the Minister Otley and his staff. Good afternoon to my colleagues, persons in the Tribune, support staff. MP uh, D. Weaver, you have not signed the oh, sorry. attendance sorry. list. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Let me do that now. <laughs> MP De Weaver, you have the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I <coughs> forgot that we did indeed have a second list. Um, I appreciate the fact for, that uh, MP Westcott Williams brought up some, well, her notification about the last statements by the Minister of Finance yesterday. And while this might seem obvious, I just wanted to, to remind that, you know, our job here as Parliament is to review a budget. So when we see increases and decreases that we can't explain, it is our right to be able to question that. When it comes to the side of the Council of Ministers, it is their duty to explain, justify, substantiate the reasons for it. And while I, I know that this government is actively trying to do this policy-based bu based budgeting, it does, what I, what I would expect is that you explain to the public and to Parliament that the, that the budget really is something that was being cleaned up by the minister. So it's not uh, as if to sound as if parliament is being chastised for asking questions, which is our duty and right, but it's to explain that if it is, if it is the minister who feels that budgets in the past have been overstated or understated in areas and not portraying rea rea realistic figures, that's what he should be saying rather than chastising parliament. So I appreciate that being brought up earlier on so that I could continue on the messaging of on top of that for my notification. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP D. Weaver. There are no further notifications. We have as agenda point for this meeting, national ordinance stipulating the budget for the country St. Martin for the service year 2023, national ordinance budget 2023, parliamentary year 2022-23-166 under IS document slash 535 slash 2022-23, dated March 6, 2023. We go over to the agenda point. <clears throat> Parliament received the national ordinance stipulating the budget of the country for the year 2023 on March 6, 2023. All members have received a copy of the draft national ordinance, a hard copy, digital link via email and on P drive. The budget 2023 is also available on our website and our Facebook page for the public. This Central Committee meeting commenced on Monday, March 13, 2023, in which each minister gave a presentation on the draft budget 2023 for their respective ministry. Members of Parliament were then given the opportunity to pose questions to the ministers. The meeting was then adjourned to allow the ministers time to prepare the answers to the questions posed by the members of parliament on the draft national ordinance stipulating the budget for country St. Martin for the service year 2023. Today's meeting is the continuation of the meeting which was adjourned yesterday. Today the meeting will continue with each minister providing answers to the questions posed by members of parliament to their respective ministry. The order which is so far known is the Ministry of VSA, followed by Minister of Finance and followed by Minister of Romy. It is important to note the following. At all times during the answering of the questions, there will be at least two ministers present in the building 
in order to ensure that the meeting can run smoothly. Each minister will return maximum two times to answer questions that were posed regarding their ministry. Members will also be given the opportunity to post clarification questions if necessary. Members of Parliament are requested to submit their questions to the Secretariat of Parliament once you start to speak or after speaking on that same day. Submitting the questions will assist with quickly drafting the final report. There will be a supper break at 6 p.m. till 6.30. I now give the floor to the Ministry of Minister of VSA to answer the questions posed by members of Parliament. Honorable Minister Omar Otley, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good day to the viewing and listening public, the honorable members of parliament. Where, without further ado, I'd like to dive right into the questions and the answers. We have the first question from MP Cyril Westcott Williams. What contributions were received per project in the country packages? And compare the amount received in 2022 to 2023. In 2022, in the area of public health, the government had received a total of 700 54,123 euro via a grant for support. In 2023, we are expected to receive upwards of 490,000. Her next question was on the general health insurance. It has been mentioned that the minister expect this to take place by January 2024. So what are the next steps for the general health insurance slash Atlee care insurance? The following steps will be are the review of the advice in the said was done in March, adjustments is ne if needed, March, April, review of advice from Council of Advice, April, adjustments if needed by May, vetting by YZ and Way, adjustments if needed by May as well. We hope to have it approved in calm by June, brought to Parliament in July. Publishing V of the LV and El Baham before October in parallel, depending on the content and courses of legislative track. And of course, if there are no amendments by members of parliament. Number three, regarding the sole proprietorships who are sole proprietors who are currently unable to receive health insurance, how are we addressing this? In January, the draft reparations legislation of SFA was sent to the said. In this reparation ordinance, I, as minister, ensured that ensured that this matter was taken up, as we believe that sole proprietors should also be given the opportunity for insure, to be insured. Do we have any reports on the transitional shelter? If so, what are the most recent reports? The transitional shelter has been a highly successful program. To date, they have transferred over 160 persons in the community. The shelter continues to play an important role in facilitating, assisting those in social crisis situations. The 50 million gillers for OZR has been reduced. Can an overview be provided? Um, an entire chart was presented from uh, via SZV. We would send this to you and the members of parliament that gives a detail on the overview. I would like to also state that the reduction is based on a discussion we had with SZV, which expect to save an annual of five to six million via the PCCP savings the Pharmaceutical Cost Containment Program. For the record, OZR decrease by 2.5 million was only instead, was only decreased by 2.5 million as opposed to the five or six million, which is expected to be. The extra two to three million will go towards the array that we still have outstanding for SLV. So based on the PCCP, SLV is projected to make an extra five to six million. Does the ministry have a policy on medical schools? No, we do not have any policy 
Um, the, there's no policy on medical schools within the Ministry of VSA. Is there a functioning Council of Public Health? Yes, MP, there is a functioning Council of Public Health. Are there tripartite consultations? Yes, MP, there are tripartite consultations. According to the ILO Convention 144, there should be at least one tripartite consultation per year. On average of three meetings are held per year. With unemployment projected at 9.5, how can we explain that we plan to collect more from work permits? Well, MP, the increase in revenue from, for work permits can be attributed to the task force pilot project. In addition, data over the past decade gives us an indication that unemployment rate is unrelated to the permit issue as the equation between skilled job seekers, unemployed persons, and those being imported as for foreign labor is not necessarily aligned, which I have stated before, the needs and wishes of our people are not aligned with the jobs that are being requested. Does the minister have an up-to-date youth unemployment figure? Based on the last labor force survey done in 2018, published in April 2019, youth unemployment from 15 to 24 was 17.9%. However, based on the Central Bank's 2022 report, the overall unemployment is projected to decrease from 12% of 2022 to 95 of 2023. MP Gums. Has the ministry taken note of the said report regarding the impact of lottery boots in low-income neighborhoods? Well, the ministry has, me as minister, has taken note. Um, the report is not officially published. We, we reached out to the said itself. It was sent, and now the COM has six weeks to render any additional advice. So we have a couple more weeks for the COM to review and then send our information back to the set. But I, do, I am aware of the report. MP, oh, with preparation of the budget, has comparison been made with SFV with the wage increase? This information will be forthcoming. Um, as as a view has not had the readily information as to compare how much was spent extra on healthcare, but this will be forthcoming and submitted to you before the OV. MP Rumo, does the minister have an update on the period poverty? This and why wasn't it taken up in the budget? The reason, MP, is that this project that this project was not yet taken up in the budget was due to the lack of concrete data. However, since then, the Ministry of VSI, in collaboration with the Ministry of ECYS, designed and disseminated a survey to the schools regarding period poverty. The survey will allow both ministries to comprehend the current situation on the island, and we will act and plan accordingly. We have also reached out to Teen Times to help um, facilitate any any surveys or information that they have um, gathered, they have sent to us. So we are in the process of coming up with a concrete plan and structure. Since then, we have also had contact with the wholesalers, and this is going um, positively well. Can you provide details on the ministry's plan to address the issue of mental health on the island and funding that is allocated? In 2023 budget, 203,000 was reserved for the improvement of the legislation, policy, and regulation pertaining to mental health. We have hired a consultant whose sole purpose is to review, analyze, and help amend any legislation related to mental health. We have also worked with the Dutch Caribbean Hospital Alliance, whereby a mental health conference was recently held where all countries within the kingdom express their grievances and bottlenecks with mental health. We have agreed to assist each other legislatively where needed to ensure that all countries, Curacao, Aruba, St. Martin, and Bonaire can move forward with the best mental health plan collaboratively. 
Can you provide an update on the ministry's effort to improve access to affordable health care, to affordable child care? In cooperation with the Ministry of Education last year, a study was done regarding the funding for daycare centers commissioned by the Department of Youth, which was carried out with the monies from the Trust Fund and UNICEF. The recommendation from these studies was presented to both ministries and the minister and the ministers must decide on the recommendations and the way forward. If the funding of the daycare center will become a reality on St. Martin, that will strengthen the daycare center and the access will be improved. Regarding early childhood development programs, the two ministries are working on improving the mini to the, mini the minimum standard. A key, key stakeholders will be trained in the new standards and will also be a part of the legislation of parents. In addition, with the increase to the minimum wage, the ministry is also working on the necessary legislation to increase the financial aid amount. We are also eagerly awaiting the results of the census to ensure that we can assess the cost of living. How is the ministry working on reducing the, the rise of non-communicable disease such as diabetes, hypertension, et cetera. The ministry has developed a, na a national multi-sectoral action plan for the prevention of con and control of NCD and two-year implementation plan that is currently being executed in collaboration with the health care stakeholders. Some notable projects include the development of a clinic guideline for hypertension management and primary care and the establishment of the Diabetic Foot Care Clinic. A similar, a similar guideline for diabetes will be developed. The ministry also is working on a health promotion program to raise awareness about hypertension, diabetes, and cancer, and organize health events and social media content throughout the year. How is the ministry addressing issues of substance abuse amongst young people? The ministry under the auspices of Social Services Unit continues to play a vital supportive role with the Turning Point Foundation through a collaborative effort and based on agreement, social workers and the crisis care unit provide direct guidance, counseling, and support for persons in a particular youth, and particularly the youth. The government legislation via financial aid and medical aid allows for those affected persons to access both products of social service. This takes us back to the above mentioned legislation for mental health where we said that mental health should also be linked to substance abuse. As we noticed through our, with our youngsters lately, we are seeing a lot of mental health crises that are linked to substance abuse. How is the ministry working on improving access to affordable nutrition, food, and low income to low income families? Although the Ministry of VSA does not have a direct control over the price of food, the ministry has been working on improving the quality of life by again increasing the minimum wage, the possibilities of increasing financial age, increasing the pension, and developing a cost of living assessment. These are ways that the ministry can help enhance buying power of the public of St. Martin and the, of those low income earners. The ministry is embarked on three agroecology programs to teach low income households how to garden and aim for food security and resilience. Through CPS the community and community development, we are preparing a high, healthy lifestyle program as well. What are the activities this year for the ministry that the ministry will undertake in reactivating the ROHA. The Ministry of VSR will continue to work in partnership with the Ministry of Education, Culture, Youth and Sports to enact the ROHA. The Ministry of Labor, my vision entails revamping, as Minister of Labor, my vision entails revamping the current labor market and the ROHA will play a critical crucial part in this reality, in becoming a reality. I move to the question of MP Helga Martin. How many projects and activities are ongoing under the NRPB? 
VSI involved in two projects, the Emergency Income Support Training Project, which entails the development of social registry system, has been extended to August 2023. Mental Health Program, which is slated to be signed in 2023 and has an implementation date until 2027. How far is the ministry with the implementation of the country packages? Ministry of VSI has three projects with the team economic reforms and another three with the team care. According to the latest implementation report drafted in February MP, all six projects progressing significantly. We all receive green, which is satisfactory and on time. How are policies linked to expenditures where is this reflected in the budget? This is reflected in the explanatory book on the policy actions. How much was spent on travel per ministry? Well, let's speak for VSA. 200,000 is budgeted for 2023. 123 was spent for travel in 2022 for the International Health Regulation Kingdoms Meeting, uh, Work Visit Health and Labor in Curacao, Kingdom Health Ministries meeting in Aruba, and also the 25th Executive Board meeting with CAFRA. What is the total consultancy budget of the cabinet for 2022 and 2023? For 2000, VSR was 555,000 was budgeted for 2023, and the expenditure in 2022 was approximately 700, I mean, 376,000. How long has the SG position been vacant? Unfortunately, since 2014. MP Bryson, please provide an update on whether businesses are still firing employees due to vaccination status. Has the department received such complaints? The Labor Dispute and Dismissal Unit has not received any recent complaints on firing due to vaccination, MP. Can the minister comment on what CPS can do to increase public awareness? Part of CPS role is health promotion. Activities are, ground, activities are grounded in the annual health observation calendar and any other public health conditions that may be important to the public awareness. For example, some areas CPS focus on including sexually transmitted infections, breast, cervical, prostate cancer, world oral health day, and many more. So yes, the idea is to make CPS be more visual in the eyes of the public. I think before COVID-19, many persons did not know the CPS department. So now that we are at the endemic stage, there are a lot more that CPS can continue to offer. MP Peterson, what is the purpose, what was the purpose of the RFP? MP, on September 6th, the RFP for the legalization of cannabis was made public. The deadline for submission was December 6th. The purpose of the RFP was a way for the government of St. Martin to request for local, regional, and international organizations who wish to work with the government, very important, with the government to create a full path towards a legal, responsible, and feasible entry into the cannabis industry. The request for proposal was strongly focused on conducting several studies into the effects of legalization of cannabis before any concrete decision can be made on how cannabis will be legalized. The aim is to find experts who will help us conduct the many studies needed to carry out, advise on the best legal framework for St. Martin in such a way that much of the economic, social, and medical benefits will remain and benefit the people of St. Martin. Ultimately, develop the required legislation and amendments to the existing legislation. Important to note, that the RFP was approved by the Council of Ministers to begin the process, and indeed it was an interministerial effort. As per the LEOL, a ministerial regulation that further regulates the interministerial 
collaboration was developed and will soon be signed for publishing. How was the, how involved was the Ministry of Justice? So before I go MP, I would just like to go back on the RFP as well for just to break it down for simple terms or anyway. Um, what is required with this RFP as well is a lot of groundwork study um, with the stakeholders, churches. We will have to do a lot of, uh, we are even looking into marijuana, uh, cannabis conferences to better explain the medical and recreational benefits of this and also financial benefits. So it's a lot of study involved with stakeholders and will be financially um, costly. How involved was the Ministry of Justice in this process? The current government of St. Martin has identified the legalization of cannabis as a priority. The Minister of Justice did bring an advice to the Council of Ministers to start an interministerial discussion on cannabis and for her team and for her support team to focus on the decriminalization aspect and its impact. The National Cannabis Legislation Work Group consists of three persons from the Ministry of Public Health, three persons from the Ministry of Justice, and three persons from the Ministry of TIAT. So yes, the justice has been actively involved, but considering that one, the main ordinance that will require the amendment to the opium legislation falls under the responsibility of the Minister of VSA. That's why VSA has taken the lead. However, justice and TIAT are very much involved. In addition, the ministries and stakeholders will be brought in during various phases as well. How many entities registered for the RFP? 21 organizations submitted. The criteria and purpose can be found in the RFP, which can be shared with members of parliament at any time. There was also a question on the tourist tax. I would like to also answer this question. This legislative trajectory was brought forward, of course, by MP Rolando Bryson and received remarks from the Council of Advice. As Minister of VSA, I like the idea of a health levy and the aspect in which the MP was taking it. So I asked the MP to forward me the legislation and all of the advice from the Council of Advice and used our resources and consultant budget to draft a legislation that would be in line with the Council of Advice to help St. Martin be more sustainable and achieve this levy as persons enter our country. One of my philosophies has always been we should not always um, increase expenses on the people of St. Martin to generate revenue, but let us uh, use it on the visitors. Um, um, a study, an impact study was conducted in which a uh, amount was given to St. Martin between 15 and $25, where according to the impact study, this would be enough for us to remain competitive and still have a significant improvement in our revenue. Now, in no way we are dictating to Parliament that it must pass, but however, this is a revenue projection in which the budget is. So therefore, it was placed in the budget. We are executing agency, so therefore, we are executing ways in which revenue can be found. If Parliament does not agree and does not pass, then a budget amendment is always applicable. So that is the reason for the implications of this tourist tax. I am answering it as VSR was the one to spearhead the study because it was originally a health levy. MP De Weaver. What is the home repair program? Is it a recurring thing or one time? The home repair program project carries out small repairs to homes for the elderly and vulnerable groups. The home repair project fall under budget post 43489-7260 projects and activities. The home repair program is a reoccurring project. This year, another cohort of the project will be launched. Please explain the reason for the decrease of 700,000 in understand. The decrease is based on the actual figures of, preceding, of the preceding year, which was around 550,000 a month, which is approximately 6.6 .6 million guilders a year. 
it is unrelated to any specific policy for this decrease. It was just based on what we actually use. Why is digitalization of the inspection application system not related to the capital expenditures? The ministry is not guaranteed that CAPEX will provide will be provided as such digitalization projects are budgeted within the projects and activities. Water collaboration, will this require an investment, uh, um, an investment in infrastructure to the front side, this water collaboration with the front side? It will require some investment as additional pipes may be needed in order to reach the location in which the front side would want us to reach, however, to reach a border. However, in 2014, most of the connections to the border were already laid, but nothing has happened since then. That side has sufficient capacity to provide to the front side. Considering the severe issues with our brothers and sisters on the front side, and we are one island, we definitely, prior, the ministry is prioritizing this activity to ensure to limit the water shortage on the front side. Why was the OZR decrease? As mentioned um, previously, but definitely I'll go into it. OZR is a sickness insurance for the civil servants, which we pay SZV. Reduction is based on a discussion we had with SZV, which was expected to save an, uh, an annual amount from five to six million costs due to the PCCP saving program which includes the generic dispensation of medication and supply via a preferred wholesaler. For the record, the OZR decrease of 2.5 million was decreased by 2.5 million instead of the five or six million which is expected to be saved. The extra two to three million will go towards the arrears that we still have for SZV. Under community development project and activities went from 500,000 to 2.6 million. Why such an increase? The reason MP, there was such a big increase is that the funds intended for transitional shelter 1.1,740,000 were transferred from social development to community development. Furthermore, the department will execute various projects um, such as the home repair valued at 700,000, which is projects for the elderly and empowerment projects in other specific groups. Under CPS, I see a decrease of 1.4. Why? 1.4 was budgeted for CPS staff during the pandemic. Since we have reached the endemic stage, we have now that value was decreased. Why does VSA not have any capital expenditures budget for 2023. The CAPEX budget is not guaranteed to be approved, therefore VSA opted to incorporate key components and project activities in the operational budget of the ministry. MP Pantoflet. What measures are being taken to address the issue of poverty, social inequality on the island, and how will these be funded? The introduction of the social registry system, for those who may not be familiar with the social registry system, this is a project that allows persons and stake, key persons within the organization to take interviews within districts. We will interview the persons within the districts and get a clear need on the family's situation, the district situation, and the poverty um, percentage or average within that district. That from this information, we'll be able to base legislation and create opportunities and also use um, projects and activities through family humanitarian affairs to better assist persons within the district instead of having an overall approach and a one size fits all. This social registry system will help us to get a unique um, explore, exploration of a person's issues and create legislation and policies and projects to better facilitate these households. So, introduction of the social registry system will assist 
the Ministry of VSA in identifying the needs of the households, including those who may fall in a poverty trap, as stated. The integrated social registry system will assist VSA in providing, implementing suitable interventions for more proactively and target the vulnerable households. The project is funded via the trust fund. Can you provide details on the ministry's plan to improve access health care service on the island? How will this be funded in the upcoming budget? The ministry has several key initiatives in the pipeline. One, as mentioned earlier, MP, the SFV 1B reparations ordinance, will, will, which will include sole proprietors to be able to have access to health care. That is one. We also have the GHI slash Atlee Care Insurance, which will increase access to insurance for all. We have the VIC legislation, which we are amending to allow, this is something that we have heard for years and many of you complain about. We send people to Colombia, Santo Domingo, and all over the world, and these same professionals are not allowed to work here. The ministry is diligently working on this. We have started, and it will. it is projected that the policy amendment will be um, made by this year. Um, we, will, we are doing the urgent care, even urgent care, which will alleviate the pressures and strain and the weights at SMMC. What is the urgent care? Where this will happen from 6 to 12 uh, as a separate facility where persons can go for non-traumatic care at late hours. The problem with SMMC, of course, um, if you break your finger or anything of that sort at, after six o'clock, you have nowhere to go but the medical center. And then here comes someone, whether a gunshot victim, a trauma victim, and they have to choose between you and that person. And of course, if I'm sitting there for five hours with my finger broken, I'm upset. So therefore, we are developing another option, urgent care, and with a 24-hour pharmacy. That is what we're looking into to help increase access to healthcare. How is the government addressing the issues of drug and alcohol abuse and what measures are being taken to prevent treatment and addiction? The ministry, under the strategic objective of Division of Labor Affairs and Social Services, continue to work in a partnership with third party NGOs, caregivers and NGOs, including but not limited to Turning Point, SMMC, Mental Health Foundation. These partnerships with these entities include involvement of social workers and also supporting council group. And as stated before, we go back to our mental health strategic plan where we will implement substance abuse in connection with mental health issues. Can you provide an update on the progress made in terms of the labor market reform and what measures are being taken to create job opportunities. Sure, MB, we are busy with the amendment to the civil code to define under what conditions the short-term contracts can be used. We brought this presentation to Parliament. Parliament received it in open arms. Um, of course, the previous amendment was brought that limits the amount of consecutive contract from three to two, but however, due to that three months and a day period, there's still an opportunity for abuse. So that is definitely needed. That is um, on the minister's desk and will be sent to the said as quick as the end of next week for that amendment. We did the SOS policy for major investors to provide funding and investment in human capital. So they provide funding towards NEPA to help strengthen our local resources as well. And part of the investment policy is the use of local machinery and to maximize the use of local personal staff personnel and staff. We have the nest.sx, the online portal to link job seekers with job opportunities. This is expected to launch in uh, the next month by April. April, um, continuous job fairs and collaboration in various businesses, job training programs to strengthen job skills and jo of job seekers. How is the government addressing the issues of aging elderly and what um, funds, where can this be allocated in the budget? We have done several projects and will continue to continue these projects for, to assist the elderly, such as the tax and as a way assistance that we offer via the help desk. We did the hygiene program for the elderly. 
We also have the smart and computer, smart computer skill program, which we intend to continue. We have the elderly health screening, which we intend to continue. As a matter of fact, I'll use this opportunity to state that we have worked with the um, elderly organizations, and there will be the next health screening will be on March 25th for our seniors. Um, we are also planning, as you know, <laughs> you want to come? To, we, um, as you know, we also plan to increase the pension as well, which is now, that legislation is now at the Council of Advice. So once that gets back, depending on any legislative changes, we will send the exit in way as well, and then we hope to have that in Parliament as soon as possible, where we hope for your approval. How is the government working to improve the quality of education and training for healthcare professionals? And what funding has been allocated? Well, although the question, in my view, is mostly for education, what VSI has done was focus on investing in NEPA, as stated through the SOS policy. We have established, where I stated, large projects invest towards NEPA. However, uh, where the portion of donations will be established in a scholarship fund, which will be used to invest in our human capital. So with the money that is injected into NEPA, we will also make a scholarship fund to help those that can't afford it, yes, can't afford it, be able to have access to training programs in NEPA for different opportunities and including, of course, and not limited to the nursing field, because you specifically asked about that as well. MP Bejlani, why is there an increase in the Department of, why is there an increase in the Department of Public Health on the projects and activities, and what projects does this include? There's an increase in projects due to the number of projects being executed. These projects include development of the activities indicated in the four country summit agreement, execution of the country packages agreement, reform and improvement within mental health, mental health care sector, the execution and development of the various NCDs, non-communicable disease program, providing the quality of care in St. Martin, which includes establishing of medical professionals and in and healthcare institution development and updating of legislation and policies and digitalization of various procedures amongst other projects. Why was a decrease in the Department of Social Development under the project, why was there a decrease in the Department of Social Development under project and activities? The decrease is due to the transfer of funds from the transitional shelter. MP, as stated before to MP Ludmila Duiva, is due to the transitional of funds from that department to the community development. Hence, you see a big decrease. Why is there an increase in the Department of Community Development on the project and activities? It goes back to the same question. There's an increase in the budget for various projects under this department, such as the Home Repair Project and the Transitional Shelter Project for elderly and empowerment, and empowerment projects in other specific community groups. How often does the ministry revisit the mission and vision? The ministry of VSR ensures the implementation of the mission and vision of the ministry throughout all legislative development policies and projects. It is important to note what we stand for and why we are doing it. So we can't do that without implicating our vision. This, one, this is MP. Oh, MP Duncan. What is the plan of approach for attracting personnel? How will the costs increase per elucidation in the budget? VSA has been successful in attracting and retaining local professionals and positioning them in VSA. Through projects, VSA through projects has the goal to sustainably keep local project staff in the ministry. VSA actively promotes opportunity for personnel to advance in their career path with this ministry. The cost increase will be based on, will be based by filing on specific amount 
of FDEs per year. At the moment, 146 out of the 149 FDEs are filled. 199 FDEs are filled, thank you, SG. Percentage-wise, we are looking at 76% of the total formation. This year, VSI is planning to fill six more vacancies if the budget permits. We will do three to five vacancies yearly until we reach our total formation of 199. So we are on a good trajectory. MP Aaron Lill, what are the plans and policies presently in place to aid social and vulnerable groups? The introduction of the social registry system will assist the Ministry of VSI in identifying the needs of the most vulnerable groups, including those who may fall into a poverty trap. The integrated social registry system will assist VSR in providing an implementation suitable in intervention more proactively that targets vulnerable households. The project is funded through the trust fund. What about physical therapists? When will they be paid? It hasn't been paid since last year. The ministry is not responsible for the payments. These payments fall under SZV. However, your concerns has been taken up with SZV, and I await an answer to see if indeed persons has not been paid from last year. That is all of the questions that I have. I now await clarifications. Thank you, Minister, for your answers. And I look to my left now to have the members of Parliament for their clarification and any more questions if they have. The first person I see is MP Sarah Westcott Williams. MP Westcott, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And before I go into my clarification questions, you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, that now we have the opportunity for clarifications and any other questions that we may have. Is it the intention that I, for example, ask my clarifications and then go into my questions for the second round one time? That is the intention. Okay, thank, thank you. Just wanted to have that clarified. Minister, thank you for the answers provided thus far. And in terms of clarifying some of your answers, the following. The reparation legislation to our health insurance was made by the SZV, I am quoting you, and it is Adeser. Can the minister inform me since when this reparation legislation is Adeser, and can the policy objectives of this draft legislation be shared with Parliament. And I say policy objectives because I know if I ask for the draft legislation, it might be said, well, since it's at a said, we're waiting for their reaction. So I'm asking for the policy objectives. The issue of the draft policy or the draft legislation for general health insurance, my same question there. Can we be provided with the policy objectives of the national health insurance to be legislated? Minister, I took note of your answer pertaining to the transitional shelter, that it is going good. Um, and so my question is, what is the duration of the contract for this service? And could we have a breakdown of the budget amount? for the transitional shelter, which is in the budget of, I believe, over a million guilders or something of that sort. Could we have a breakdown of what the cost for the government of the transitional shelter is and the duration of the agreement slash program? Mr. Chairman, the minister indicated that the chart by the SZV regarding the OZR can be provided, I would ask that that be done so that it be provided, that chart. And at the same time, can we receive an overview from the SZV regarding 
the different funds, the funds managed by the SZV, can we receive an overview of how financially those funds are standing currently? The minister confirmed that there is no policy on medical schools, and then I asked if there is, because I know for the AUC there was, and I know there's another medical school apparently registered on St. Martin, so I would like to know, is the agreement with the AUC still ongoing, and is there an agreement with a new medical school? And if not, is it the plan to have one with the other medical school as well? The minister went in, Mr. Chairman, to explain that there is, and this is my word, a mismatch between the, un the unemployment, so in other words, the employment seekers and those for whom a work permit is being sought. Does the minister have any current information as to that mix match? And such as, what are the positions for which persons are registered as unemployed? One, and give an overview of the request. It can be sort of a moment take, so a take as to what the situation is right now. And what are the requests coming from businesses for employment, if I can get that comparison in numbers or categories or positions. The minister, I took note of your comment regarding the increase in pension. Is this proposed increase an increase in the AOV pension as currently managed by the SZV? And did I understand the minister to say that that is currently at the Council of Advice? I would just like to know, because minister, as we continue this discussion on the budget, I hope to be able to have a discussion with you regarding the introduction of a general pension. A general pension scheme. As you know, the AOV pension scheme is a limited pension scheme. So, that's me. Yes, um, so Mr. Chairman, those are my, those are my uh, clarification questions, actually, and I was expecting the minister to answer and then come with the next question. So I will still have my questions, but these are my clarification questions that, I'm, that I just put forward. That is based on the answers giving, given. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. So if I had to understand correctly, you have more questions now? So, so do you want to ask them right away? Because the minister is going to only come twice. So let's add up all the questions one time. So the next time after the finance minister, when everyone finishes, he will come with the clarification and answer. I hear you. Let um, some other members, I hope other members have either clarifications or questions, and I will follow with my questions. Okay, that'll be good. <clears throat> the next person on the list is MP Melissa Gums. MP Gums, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon to you, my colleagues, the minister, his support staff, and those in the Tribune and joining us online. Thank you for the answers to the questions, Minister, but I just wanted to know the second part of my question about the SARE report. Um, asked if the ministry has considered the impact of gambling addiction on mental health and if there are plans to include gambling addiction in the legislative revision um, regarding mental health in the expected expenses highlight that you provided in your presentation yesterday. So if you could just clarify that um, second part of that question. Thank you. Thank you, MP Gums. Do we have any other uh, members for clarification at this time? Did, no, yes, yes, okay. MP Grisha Heliger martin you have the floor. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon to the minister and his staff, and so good afternoon to my colleagues and those listening and viewing online. Uh, I asked a general question to all and part the, of the ministries, and seemingly I think everyone already kind of noticed that, that I asked specifically how are the policies linked to the expenditures and where is it reflected accurately? I can. If I look at line item 43, oh my God, glasses, glasses, sorry. 
43489, and I look at the policy that in the explanatory notes, it's, a, it's off, and I notice that it's like that for many of the ministries. Um, I don't know if I, 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 the response I received from the minister through you, Mr. Chair, is to go to the explanatory notes, but it's obvious that a lot of it is off. It's not in sync with what is in, in, the, in the budget. So um, I, if the minister could explain me that, and if every minister coming in could explain me why, um, I, I need some clarity on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Grisha Heliga martin Next, MP De Weaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if you're trying to compare the, the Dutch version of the budget with the English explanatory notes, it doesn't match. So if any members of parliament are doing that, that's the only thing. If you're trying to just trace it in the Dutch version, it does match up. So the, what, what's in the English version is different, just to put it out there. Because I believe the MP is trying to match English with the Dutch. Everything is in the Dutch version that we have in a bound copy and you have to use it in there to match. The English version was purely the two lifting translated, but the, if you're looking at the uh, account numbers and for the detail, the English version is not reliable for that. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, making that comment. Um, that's something we will look at further. Um, are there any other clarifications from members of parliament? No? Um, I just have two clarifications for you, Minister. Um, regarding the health levy, um, good to see that, that that clarification has been made. Um, but also, I think it's uh, just to note that you have indeed considered this, for example. Uh, first of all, the fact that the French side charges what is known as, and I say the French side, the French side airport, so France as a whole, including the, the French side airport, charges what is called the solidarity tax which is 20 euros and 27 cents. And that goes to a division called Unit Aid, which promotes healthcare within the French system. Uh, just if you've taken note of that within your, your research as well, just to add some context that this is happening right on the northern side of the island as well. Regarding um, the inclusion within the budget, I have read um, according to the CFT's advice, which the Council of Advice also took note of and um, have mentioned it in their advice, is that the CFT advises to include the financial effects of this, the way they mention the various tax initiatives, including um, Airbnb adjustments to tourism taxes, health levy, etc., to include it in the 2023 budget. So kind of as a, uh, as a follow-up to what you mentioned, that it is being included in the budget just that if you verify indeed that this was also on advice of CFT and as noted by the Council of Advice. I see MP Westcott Williams is uh, requesting the floor and will continue with her questions. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, this is a follow-up clarification and my colleague MP Gums referenced to it, but I want to take the matter of the the matter of the lottery advice from the SER. And while the minister indicated that he is awaiting the advice and the advice has to be published, I asked the minister if he's aware of the information from that advice as in the daily newspaper today, one. Um, is the minister aware of the, of the comments coming apparently from the TIAT ministry? On the, I'm talking on the lottery advice from the SER. I see the minister was looking um, questioned. And so, and is the minister aware of the fact that, so that the information from this advice is public, one. Um, secondly, the report is with parliament, two. And there was a comment from the Ministry of TIAT on it. So I don't get from the Minister of TIAT, the Minister of VSA, and the Minister of Finance a cohesive approach slash position on the matter of um, the lottery boots and the big amount of these boots that are on the island and the effects of this for, um, for the country. So I just wanted to add that to the issue of the lottery boots. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Sarah 
Westcott Williams. I don't see any other MP having any clarification or further questions. No more questions to the minister. So I would stop this deliberation for Minister of VSA, and I would like to see if you need more time to prepare your answers, ministers, or your right away. For the clarifications. Basically, most are clarification. You're ready right away? No. So we'll adjourn the meeting for three minutes for a switchover of the Minister of VSA, and the next one in line is Minister of Finance. Meeting adjourned for three minutes.
Good afternoon and welcome back to the continuation meet of the Central Committee meeting of today. We have the Minister of Finance in-house. Welcome Minister of Finance and the support staff. I would straight dive into the Minister to answer the questions posed by members of Parliament. Minister of Finance, you have the floor. In public. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to first start off with some um, comments I believe were made in, in the notifications to bring also some clarity. Um, some comments made by MP Sarah Scott Williams. And also, I would like to say that um, uh, I appreciate the comments that made also by, or the clarity also made by MP Lumina De Weaver in regards to my feedback yesterday, which is more in line with my comments yesterday. In regards to the budget and uh, me referring to the cuts and so forth, I again want to make it, make it clear that what we did was again look at the actuals of the last five years, um, spending of the last five years, and the budgets of the last five years. <clears throat> In addition to that, we set the parameters for every ministry. So every ministry had their parameters set, which was sent to them in advance, and they then had to prioritize within that um, budget, within, within the amount given. So it's not that the minister, for, for example, cut the budget. That was the decision in terms of the priority given within the amounts that were given to you. Um, at the end of the day, and it was said a few times um, yesterday, not only by the government side, but also by the MPs, in regarding um, capacity, capacity within the government. You only could do so much with the people that you have, right? So it's also unrealistic to put uh, a wash list of, of stuff, for example, budget and then you still can't get to execute it and that's also things that we looked at also that we have all these items and you, sometimes it becomes a wish list of stuff but the execution of it um, with the capacity we have is unrealistic so again um, we believe that this is um, the most realistic budget we could have gotten and we will continue to improve um, in the 2024 budget mr chairman i'll start with the answering of your questions, actually. And uh, the reason why, because we had a, a question regarding online payment. And I believe that there is a confusion, um, and we, we, have, we are trying our best to market the differences in online payment. Typically, in the years gone by, when we said online payment for vehicle tax payment in the past, that basically was a wire transfer. You go online to your... Um, your local bank, and you would put in the government information, and you would transfer money to the account of the government, indicating that you're paying for such and such, vehicle tax payment in this case. When we refer to our current online system, it's a different system. And I will just like to show it very quickly, Mr. Chairman, and then continue to answer the questions. In our online payment system currently, you pay via credit card, visa, uh, credit card or visa, uh, uh, visa debit, and um, you get your receipt pretty much immediately. So it's not that you have to wait weeks and so forth on that. You get a receipt with a barcode also, and we also now updated the back end system, which we are um, in the process of using it currently, where we have now scanners um, hooked up to tablets, which would then scan the barcode when you go to pick up your plate, and then your information pops up immediately, and you go and get it. So we are busy trying to innovate and update all the processes. And just for clarity's sake, let me just get this up and running. seconds. Alvin, good. Oh. No volume. 
So this is one of the few services that we have online. It's actually the first one. So you see you put in your plate number, you put in your number, and it automatically populates the whole area. You go down, you upload your inspection document. Insurance. Credit card or Visa debit number. It's processed, and as I said before, we have now the video case also online, and we are aiming to get business license also online. And there it is, your receipt that you get in your email. So Mr. Chairman, I just want to be very clear on the differences of what you uh, refer to your Question and what we refer to now is currently online payment. In terms of receipts, is that clear on what the receipt does for an ID and if it's already active or whether it can't be activated? Okay, that's the next slide. Okay, and I'll move on to the answering of the questions. MP, starting with yourself. The first question is based on the tourist tax, but I also refer that question back to the Minister of ASA, who already explained the tourist tax. He confirmed with me. That was his initiative. MP asked for um, provision to be made on the travel accommodation, the budget of our ministries, high councils, and other government trips for the year. Uh, Vromi is at 847. Tiat 401, VSA 200,000. Um, ECYS 62,000. Justice 228, Finance 201. And uh, 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 the department. Next question Could you provide more details on item 2100 from the Integrity Chamber? It shows a total of 1.77 million. The answer is being as a total because it is a subsidy that they receive from government. All subsidies are on total and not broken down per category. One second, Mr. Chairman. Is the vision and mission statement shared with the organization? How often is it revisited? The mission and vision is, has been shared with the organization. It, it has also been published in the National Gazette. It's also in the walls of my cabinet. It's also in our meeting room. And we also send it out with our Finance Connects and we try to include it in different versions of the documents that we have. The next question was regarding the payment of receivers, which I just showed just now. You will ask for the formation of the different um, departments and how many employees they have. Uh, the cabinet five with five staff, staff with oh six with three staff, finance 17 with six staff, Fiscal Affairs 7 with 2 staff, Financial Accounting 2017 with 17 staff, Tax Office Understanding 24 with 12 staff, Receivers 57 with 43 staff, Tax Inspection 38 with 30 staff, and the Control and Upsporting 23 with 8 staff for a total of 204 in, for the formation and 126 for the staff. 
I now move on to the answers for MP Sarah Scott Williams. MP asks a question regarding the central bank and uh, what appeared in the news regarding the appointment of the board. For the National Security Services of Coruscant St. Martin, there was no legal basis to execute security assessments for the members of Supervisory Board Council of the Central Bank in Coruscant St. Martin. Without these screenings, the countries were not able to timely appoint the members of, of the Supervisory Board. For these circumstances, the President of the Common Court of Justice of Aruba, Curacao, and St. Martin, and of Bonilla City Stations and Saba, is authorized to temporarily appoint members of the Board. Based on Article 25, ninth paragraph of the Central Bank Statute, these members are appointed until the appointment by the countries is made. On August 23rd, 2021, the President of the Common Court of Justice appointed two members on behalf of the Curacao and three members on behalf of St. Martin, while the term of another member on behalf of Curacao was not expired as yet. On November, on November 9th, 29th, 2021, the President of the Common Court of Justice reappointed the remaining members on behalf of Curacao Supervisory Board Council. As Curacao, in the meantime, put the legislation in place for the National Security Service to assess candidates from Curacao, Curacao wants to appoint two of their current members by resolutions, as all members are appointed by two, resolu by two resolutions, one for Curacao and one from St. Martin, and will be sworn in by both governors. The Minister of Finance in Curacao inquired on the state of affairs of our screening legislation. Next answer was regarding the digital currencies and if I had any discussions with the central bank. Yes, I've had discussions with the central bank on digital currencies and no, I haven't gotten any formal doc documentation for this. Next, has the Minister of Finance written central bank regarding the motion? The letter on the Molly Bay property development was received, MP, in your letter. And the answers are forthcoming in accordance with Article 62 of the Constitution and the Article 69 of the Rules of Order of the Parliament of St. Martin. I also believe that the, the, the date given um, was Thursday coming. Next question was regarding dollarization in the country package and the Caribbean Gilder. According to team, D3, the financial sector, the Central Bank of Curacao and St. Martin will be based on the findings of the IMF report on the pros and cons of dollarization. Analyze how the possible disadvantages associated with having an own currency in the country can best be overcome. For the sake of clarity, it is emphasized that the introduction of the Caribbean Giller is a short term not directly related to the decision making about a choice between maintaining our own currency for the monetary union of Curacao and St. Martin. On the one hand, and dollarization on the other, as this will take some time. In the NBC Martin should choose the dollar to, to dollarize, effectively replacing the, the domestic currency with the US dollar. It will require a transition period of at least five years and must be considered. So the introduction of the Caribbean Gila does not have to frustrate or constrain possible future decisions to dollarize in the view of the time required for both the decision making process and transition period needed to officially switch currencies. In the meantime, nevertheless, it remains urgent in the interest of safe and efficient payment system and outdated and costly Nesentis Gilders is replaced by the Caribbean Gilder. The following question, MP, just for clarity's sake, um, five, six, and seven, um, will be answered for by the Ministry of General Affairs, which were um, a mutual agreement being signed by the Prime Minister, country packages, and to get a complete overview of the cap. Um, yes, five, six, and seven is AZ. So country packages, all those questions were referred to by the AZ. Um, going to the next one, for finance, MP, for finance CapEx, we have budgeted 22.1 million for financial management and the restructuring of the tax office. And in the Hawana Deans, we have 5.8 million dollars budgeted. Uh, 
Next question was in regarding, question eight was regards to the tax reform. And has the COM decided on the plan that was presented, taking Parliament's observations into account? No, not as yet. We have gotten the report, and we are putting together for, for not this COM, but the next following COM, hopefully. And then the COM still has time to then give feedback on the comments made by Parliament. Question nine was again the tax um, regarding the, the health levy tax, and I believe the Minister of Asa also sufficiently answered that, according to what he stated. Next question, 11, was referring to the actuals under the post for 2022. The actual for 2022 of Parliament is, or was, 395,000, and the understanding for the Khafir was um, 97,000. 612. The Council of Advice next. The Council of Advice salaries has been reduced by 25%. Please explain. Based on the efforts made to have a balanced budget for 2023, cuts were made in order to achieve this. In consultation with the Council of Advice, vacancies that were considered non critical were cut. In this case, the cutting of one non critical vacancy constitutes for about 25% in personnel costs. Next, 13, please explain security service, Sir Martin. The salaries has been reduced by 10%. Based on efforts made to have a balanced budget for 2023, cuts were made in order to achieve this. In consultation with the security service of Sir Martin, vacancies that were considered non-critical were cut. In this case, the security service, the cutting in part of non-critical vacancies amounted to 10% of the personal cost. Next question was regarding to the Disaster Fund, again, this is an uh, answer for the Ministry of General Affairs. 15, vacation allowance is scattered over the budget and column of 2022. I believe that's, the answer is in 2022, the vacation allowance was paid out and therefore taken up in the budget 2022 amendment. At a time of preparation, we only had the information per ministry available it will decide to put it as a total line item under the staff bill of, of each ministry. However, this will be corrected in the annual accounts or the year reckoning as the proper allocation will be made there. Next question, question 16 was regarding the Learn Smart program from Coursera, the cost, if it's still going on and so forth. As I mentioned in my presentation, yes, the Coursera um, courses, what we have called now the Learn Smart, with support from the SMDF is still ongoing. We pay $100,000 a year in fees. Question 17 was asked to explain more in depth the increase in projected of taxes, economic growth, GDP. The actual income tax as per the quarter four report was 4.1 million guilders. Seeing that we are expecting a GDP growth of 10%, the total income for 2023 has been estimated to be at 4.9 million guilders. Next question, 18, was in regard to excise tax on fuel in 2023 compared to the amount collected in 2021. The total realization for 2022 was 7.9 million guilders. Therefore, the budget for 2023 is estimated to be 8 million guilders. As for the 30 million guilders, that was at the time the expected realization for 2023, as mentioned in the financial system. However, something that was erroneously booked and has now been corrected, so the actuals for 2021 were actually 8.8 .8 million guilders as reflected in the 2021 financial statement. The next question. We have a question that is for the Ministry of Tiat. It was an assessment on the lottery boots. That's 20. The next question, again, is the Minister aware of the Seattle advice? Yes, I am aware of the Seattle advice, and I have read the Seattle advice. 
Next question, casino fees. The 7.2 million guilders estimated for collection of casino fees. What is this based on? And what is CFTA's constant proposal for casino tax? The amount is based on the, ac uh, the accrual amount invoiced yearly for casino fees. The CFTA is advised that we follow through on removing the TOT exemptions on casinos. Next, how much outstanding has been paid since the last update? From December 2022 to date, an amount of 633,000 guilders has been paid since the last update that amount stated is only in license fees. There's a projected collection of 5 million guilders for Airbnb. What is the basis for this 5 million guilders? The amount projected is based on the approximate amount of money generated by Airbnb rentals for 2022. The Ministry of Finance will engage in an exercise to locate from individuals and companies of their tax obligation as it pertains to rental property. I also like to state that the Ministry has now currently been um, testing software that actually allows us to see um, how many, not, not just Airbnb, but how many home sharing properties there are on the island, um, the income, the locations, the units. Um, we also see the the host, um, the area, how much the how much that particular host has made for the year, and um, the amount of days it has been rented out and so forth. So the data we're getting is um, pretty extensive, and we'll be using the data to continue to collect. And we are we and we also have been in the contact with Airbnb. We have sent them our documents, and now we're just waiting on them to give feedback also. Again, the tourist tax that was answered by Min VSR. Government's dividend policy has been shared with the government-owned companies. And the question is, has it been shared with the government-owned companies? Yes, for the year 2023, no dividend income is taken up in the budget. However, the Council of Ministers adopted the dividend policy framework that originally dated from May 2013. This framework has been updated and is considered as a starting template which can be adjusted to finalize the dividend policy from the government-owned companies after taking it into consideration the specific rates for each company. The next step should be for the government-owned companies to formulate a dividend policy which, consider, which considers the capitalization criteria for the respective entities for the entity-specific policy to be approved by the shareholder. And I believe we have gotten some feedback from some entities already on the dividend on adopting the dividend policy um, that matches their entity. Next question, are there any changes expected to the vehicle inspection? The amount collected in 2022 was 20 point 20 point five million guilders. Uh, sorry, twenty thousand. 20,454 guilders. The increase is based on the, in, on the inspection fees that Ministry of TIA can elaborate on. Did the Harbor GB actually pay their concession fee in 2022? GB is netted. The total received for 2022 was 6.4 million guilders, and for the Harbor received 4 million guilders. Next, the, discuss the discussions the discussions on debt refinancing with the Netherlands started. What exactly is Cartec's proposal? Cartec is asked to provide assistance regarding the issue, but has not presented a proposal as yet. Negotiations are now going on with Bezaka about the conditions surrounding the challenge of obtaining a large term, a long-term sustainable financing approach for St. Martin that is bearable for our society. The recent visit of the Bezaka delegation revealed that the Netherlands wants a structured model to be budget neutral for them. This narrows on our maneuverability substantially and hinders any conversation uh, regarding grants. Furthermore, in case of the application of a grace period, this would be financed by St. Martin as well. Next question, are the minister cars going to be replaced in 2023? Do not the ministers have new vehicles at the moment? No, the ministers do not have new vehicles at the moment. Actually, I believe one or two cars are in such bad conditions that it's, 
is a safety concern for some ministers, actually. The cars were purchased in 2014. Um, yes. Next question, CapEx 2023, when and how will the approval be given? Will it be per project? What are steps being taken? The budget 2023 has been approved by the Council of Ministers, and does the investments in the budget have been in approved by the Council of Ministers? I'd also like to note that the CapEx items in 2022 are, did get positive um, up feedback uh, approval from CFD, and most of those projects have been put on to 2023, but the budget 2022 was not approved by CFT. And again, for 2023, they are pretty positive. I also heard that while they were here in Parliament, they also indicated such. And now move on to the questions by MP Lutmila Duncan. MP's question was in regarding brain drain and creative ways of getting it done. The total amount of personnel was decreased in 2023 in comparison to 2022, but this was mainly due to a reduction in OZR and over time of about 4 million gillers. If you see page 11 of the illustration, the reduction was not related to vacancies. The increase in projected for personnel in the multi-annual is related to outstanding vacancies, FTEs being budgeted. And now move on to the questions by Akeem Arundel. MP would like to know about the vacation pay given out in 2021. St. Martin was to present a balanced budget to be able to abandon the temporary law, corona measures, which contains a reduction of 12.5% on labor conditions. Since 2023, budget is balanced, the 12.5% is not applicable for 2023, and vacation monies of 2023 will be paid. And I'll move on to the question by MP Rimu. What is the ministry's vision as it relates to the financial literacy of our people, which is one guaranteed way that we can strengthen our economy? Um, that's a good question, MP. The ministry is working on um, financial literacy week. Uh, we're looking at June, where we have um, a lot of different activities regarding financial liter literacy. Um, education, seminars, workshops, and, and so forth. Um, so I look forward to that. We're looking to have it also published also to make it something more official. So we're looking to have a financial literacy week. Um, actually, some, some, um, some staff actually think we need to do a financial literacy month, but I think a week is a good way to start at least. The following question was um, working along with the Ministry of Education, ECYS on this. And yes, we, um, we love to um, work with ECYS on this. I think we also um, we have some plans on working on ECYS regarding um, financial literacy. Your fifth question was regarding financial literacy also. I think that really is back to question one. Um, that it's important for our young people and so forth, which I agree. That's one of the reasons why we started the National Youth Pitch and uh, we'll continue to promote and work on this program. And I'll move on to the questions by MP Chanel Brownbill. MP asks about new methods of technologies that have been added to Budget 2023. And the cost of these technologies and what they were. As I, as I mentioned before, we started the, the online payment system, as, as I showed in my introduction. Um, we also are working on 
a feature technology that it, it should be out in June. That process started in 2022. And we are busy working on the ERP system for the whole Ministry of Finance. Next question was, was regarding the government-owned companies and investing profits back into government. For that question, it goes back to the dividend policy, which we have established within the Council of Ministers, have sent to the different entities, and we are looking forward to having a getting dividends in the near future, hopefully 2023, but for sure no, no data in 2024 when the policy in the entities have been updated. We've also asked the entities to also update the articles of incorporation to reflect um, what we have in the dividend policy. I now move on to the questions for MP Christoph Emmanuel. While the budget is closed, in a sense, expenses are equal to income. The budget clearly is in balance, as Article 3, sub 3 is talking about an authorization that the Minister of Finance has to refinance existing loans of Hurricane Irma, COVID-19, which are due in 2023. The MP also asks about re re renegotiation if it has started, and he's also trying to understand whether the budget has been excluded from these loans, and asks for me to clarify. First of all, I would like to state that the budget is an indication of what is to be expected for, for the incoming year, based on the signed loan agreements between the lenders of St. Martin. Although the budget two years prior to IRMA were balanced, the, final, the financial statement, which represents what actually happened, showed a negative result of 10 million guilders. The budget was not excluded of the loans. The amount can be found in the capital expenditure pages 66 and 68, as well as the start, the start A, page 95 from the Katala book. Refinancing is an in, refinancing is an in and out. One of the issues to be, ter to be determined is what the interest rate will be from the Netherlands because momentarily that does not allow refinancing at 0% but this would be part of the debt negotiations, which is part of the proposal, and it's the discussion still pending or happening. For the next question, it was more of a question than a statement, and um, the staff didn't really understand, but I'll repeat what was taken, to taken note of. Uh, so who is, who is responsible for the conditions that made our better Cesari, sorry, uh, the Prime Minister has given carte blanche, there were a few comments in between. Um, so I believe, or from what I read the questions yesterday, the MP was referring to authorization for the Prime Minister, the Minister of General Affairs as needed for receiving funding and contributions respectively for the implementation of the country packages and the subsidies that can be requested and provided to St. Martin, as these fundings will be based on established implementation agendas and plans of approach. This is certainly not a carte blanche cartel. So if, if you could give some clarity in that statement, then you could properly answer. MP said that he sees on capital investments that are listed for 69000 69 million, sorry, for which ministry has authorized and will be seeking loans. Who has to approve this loan as the minister has been mandated by the national ordinance to take such a loan and there is no maximum interest rate placed on such a loan? What would the collateral be and who's, and who's responsible to ensure that the country is in place at risk? The capital investments amount is not 69 million, but 85.2 million. Total refinancing needed is 419 million. The financing of the CapEx, liquidity refinancing, and the financing of the study loans is shown on page 66. Page 66 gives an overview of how the financing will be capitalized. Based on the overview, only 69.3 million will be needed to be borrowed for CapEx as other financing funds are available, which is shown on page 66. Once the budget has been approved, on Article 12 from CFT, a request is submitted to the Netherlands to get a loan on behalf of Sir Martin. The next was in regards to the capital expenses that are listed at 85 million. Because the loan has not been approved in 2022, investments 
could not be executed and we didn't get a loan. 2022 were transferred to 2023. If the 2022 loan was approved, the transfers were not needed. Additionally, to the 2022 submitted CapEx, we have added more items, hence the reason for an increase in comparison to 2022. Next question. When it comes to increasing wage tax on the Ministry of Finance, 17.7 million dollars, tourist tax 4.2, turnover tax 13. This means that we have an additional 276 million dollars in new businesses. Our more than 10% increase in GDP in 2023. Seriously, where is it? The projected amounts are based on the actuals from the quarter report of 2022, which Parliament has. Actuals have been doing better than projected, hence why the increase may be substantial. Do we have an Airbnb law that we can attach in the income? Income that's going to generate 5 million gillers is that law already? MPN did mention this earlier, but you said you wanted your answer spe specific. Are you good with it? Okay. The tourist tax was also answered by MP. Next question, room tax, 5.5 million. Can it be implemented legally right now? Room tax is part of the existing tax regime and therefore is currently executed. Next question, we had to balance budgets. We had to go into a deficit, but according to the law, the CFT, once you have three consecutive budgets, how does this consecutive work? And MP went on to further elaborate on that. Whether we have three consecutive balanced budgets or not, we still have over a billion gillers in debt. We actually have to generate budget surpluses to be able to reduce prior year deficits. Without getting rid of outstanding deficit or getting debt forgiveness, balanced budgets going forward is of little help. In addition, based on Article 33 of Kingdom Act Financial Supervision, Curacao and St. Martin, five years after 10, 10, 10, and then after every three years, a committee evaluates if the financial supervision can be withdrawn, limited or continued. Based on the evaluation report, the Kingdom Council of Ministers decides on the, finals, on the financial supervision. The last evaluation was executed by the Evaluation Committee, NFTA 2021. In this report, it stated, in addition to an opinion on compliance with the standards from Article 15 of the NFTA, the committee also indicates in its opinion whether Article 25 of the NFTA, NFTA was enforced in the relevant years. The fact that Article 25 is enforced means that it is allowed to deviate from part of the standards in Article 15 due to extraordinary, extraordinary events. Irrespective of the, of the applicability of Article 25, the committee finds that the countries have not complied with the standards of Article 15. The committee is aware that the extraordinary events leading to the entry into force of Article 25 play an important role, limiting factor in complying with the standards of Article 15. I believe this, I believe this report has also been sent to Parliament, NFTA 2021. I now move over to MP Helga Martin. Does the government require financial support from the Netherlands remaining fiscal year 2023? If so, how much? If not, please provide a solution, why not? Budget 2023 will be the first year that we do not need to create support in our own audience from the Netherlands since the past from Hurricane Irma and COVID-19 pandemic as the budget 2023 is balanced. Of course, not withstanding any future natural disasters, pandemics, and so forth. Can Parliament be provided with a complete liquidity prognosis for the entire fiscal year of 2023, including elucidation? And please refer to the quarterly implementation report 2023 through which a liquidity prognosis for the year 2023 will be provided. These reports are sent to Parliament on a quarterly basis, six weeks after the, the quarter has ended. As I mentioned previously, one of my answers, the quarterly report, the fourth quarterly report was sent already. It's in the hands of Parliament. Next, answer. Is the minister executing or going to execute the motion re related to debt cancellation? In discussions with the Netherlands, um, I'm very clear on this, 
we have taken emotion into consideration. We have we've always used debt cancellation, forgiveness, and grants as um, our starting discussion point in all discussions with, within lens on not just the COVID-19 loans and not just the Hurricane Emma loans, but all the loans. In addition, in addition to that, however, until now the NENS is stating that there's no room for uh, debt cancellation in our negotiations. The Ministry of Basic Health has also mentioned for 2023 that their, the discussions have to be budget neutral. In addition to that, initiatives have started to establish a multi-annual economic framework to base further discussions on debt repayments or debt cancellations. Next question was regards to Article 73. Um, to answer your question, MP, on, fin on financial and other obligations of the government of the Netherlands under Article 73 of the UN Charter, it would be in essence to qualify the countries of the Kingdom of the Netherlands and to substantiate if Sir Martin attained a full measure of self-governance or not. Once this conclusion is made, it is necessary to see how Article 73 of the UN Charter will apply and, be, and could be interpreted. For this, a larger discussion is needed. Next, has the Minister explored other alternatives, options regarding the refinance of loans? If yes, how and when and which loans? If not, please motivate. Yes, on October 14, 2020, we floated a bond of 75 million dollars. We considered the establishment of an investment vehicle and we evaluated our government-owned company's interests. With regard to alternative funding, the legal possibilities are indicated in Article 46 of our National Accountability Ordinance and Article 16 of the Kingdom Act Financial Supervision, Curacao and C. Martin. These options are basically to obtain the loans against the most favorable conditions, selling or buying shares and establish legal entities. Regarding the expiring loans, discussions and initiatives have started to establish a multi-annual economic framework to base further discussions on debt repayments or debt cancellation. The next question was regarding CARICOM and the 10-point plan of agenda. I believe the PM has elaborated on this, but for the Ministry of Finance, we need to research and discuss further Next question was regarding how many projects and activities have been completed or ongoing that were funded under the trust fund. The Prime Minister says she has provided and will provide again all the documentation regarding the projects and entities that were funded via the trust fund to Parliament. Next question was regarding how far the ministries with the implementation of the country packages, and if this is reflecting the budget, can I speak on behalf of all the ministries, so that could maybe be provided on general affairs, but for us, the progress of the country package initiatives um, is going pretty well. I believe we are, uh, for the amount that we have, I think we are the most fur furthest along, and the budget contains all known costs and investments under project code 00014. So again, for the related amounts that is in project code 00014. How the country packages, the SDGs, the individual, individual mission and vision of each ministry combined and reflected in the budget and monitored. We have uh, a committee that um, SORB and the SG platform and one other individual they form the committee that oversees the country packages and updates the ministers. So we get updates from the SG platform that goes to this committee, and that's how we stay up to date with all that's going on within the country packages. They also send us reports and also notify us when we are delayed or there's any deadlines that we have to meet and so forth. 
how the process, how the policy is linked to the expenditure and where is it reflected accurately. We are working towards an improved and more accurate reflection of the policies within the budget, with the ministry's engagements with policy-based budgeting, the effects of this training have already started to appear in the budget in the two-lifting book. This specific type of engagement are also taken up in the country package and will be taken up in the implementation process in public financial management. Next question, how much was spent on court cases per ministry in 2022? What did it entail? Please categorize how much did we lose, one, or ongoing. In 2022, 1.1 million guilds were spent by the government on court cases. As this at this present time, I will not be able to provide a response on what each court case entailed and the win-loss ratio. I will need more time to execute that exercise as my colleague ministers will need to be involved to elucidate the win-loss ratio and what each court case entailed. Next, for the Ministry of Finance, 201,000 has been budgeted for 2023 and the actual spend in 2022 was 118,000 regarding um, travel. And regarding how many consultants are working for, the, for each cabinet, for the Ministry of Finance, including the cabinet, we have budgeted 225,000 guilders. And in 2022, the amount was 45. Point eight thousand, which was spent on consultancy, and we have one. Yeah. The last question was: How many ministries are missing SGs? How long have they been vacant per ministry? I left that for the Prime Minister in charge of general affairs and personal affairs. And now move on to. And for the Ministry of Finance, we have one acting SG. And now move on to the question from MP Rolando Bryson. What is coming to the coffers means by means of grants, loans to country packages? For 2023 MP, we have budgeted for the Ministry of Finance an amount of 22 million coming in in terms of um, money grants coming in from, for the country packages. The next question, MP, was in regard to the, the, is there a total number we can give in terms of what's coming to the budget to help cover some of these country packages expenses? This total would uh, diminish of, of as that would have for all, uh, all ministries. Next question, what if any costs have been incurred in 2022 and budgeted for in 2023 have been related to implementation of common reporting standards? In 2022 MP, approximately 400,000 guilders was spent on CRS exchange of information on a non-reciprocal basis. This amount was spent over a 12 month span of time. The amount budgeted in 2023 is 600,000 guilders. MP said he noticed, for example, in 2022 budget, there were items where they were listed in Ministry of Finance, last bucket, in the amount of 1.1 million guilders, and then in 2023, I see it's no longer there. Maybe we can get an explanation of why some of these last bucket items in the budget were in 2022 and now have been removed. Initiatives that were finalized in 2022, MP, will not appear in 2023. Monies received in 2022, but but not being paid out before March 31st, 2023, are supposed to be visible in budget 2023. And your following question was the answer three. And similar for your question six. Next question seven, can I mention give some explanation on the, con the contributi and lit maskop? Lit maskop? This concerns subscriptions to OECD, Cartax, CTS, CF, among others. The next question was Taurus Levy. That again was already answered. The next question was, why has an eight million guilders for the year 2022 not changed in the year 2023 since it had a relief? Uh, 
uh, this was already answered also. This was regarding the excise tax, excise tax duty. The 2023 income is esti estimated based on a real income of 2022. This can be conservative. Uh, this can be a conservative estimation, but it was done as realistic as possible at the time the budget was compiled. You also asked about the 5.8 million dollars for capital for Lance Paquette. This amount is to be used for the modernization of the financial management system, ICT. The next questions were for the Ministry of AZ. Is there any consideration for a strategy to increase more legal support for the ministries? That's a general fair question and the previous one also. Next question was, I see the dividend central bank is a blank item in the budget. Can I get some information from the Ministry of Finance? Why? Central bank generated a loss of 2.9 million dollars in 2021. No profit and loss in for are available for 2022. However, when comparing the balance sheet per December 2021 and 2022, the capital reserves movement dropped, which indicates a loss for 2022. In addition, Article 4 of the Central Bank Charter says, the door the bank Yarlex Hamalto Bins Wort, Nada Donazi Nada Dotasi of Anzevering von Article Viren der Tachle Twe, Hununda Reserve of Funds, and eventually eventually reservings, so as Badult in Article Viren der Tach, in the cost of the land restored, conformed to Verdeel Slurtel Hunumd in Article Viren der Tachle Dri von der Vendese Regling. So if there's a loss, no dividends will be paid out apparently based on the articles. 14, I read that there's work being done on the dividend policy, which I answered already. Minister um, MP asks, is it not possible to request an interim dividend? According to the statutes of the SLS. Uh, just we have a point of order from MP Emmanuel. Yes. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, my apologies for interrupting the minister in his deliberation, but you was explaining something a while ago in Dutch. Do you mind also repeating it in English, the translation to what you said a while ago? If you can, I thank you very much. I mean, if you can read it like <laughs> that, I would want to believe that you can also. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, Minister, okay. for your indulgence. Uh, I'll try my best to do this translation. So if the bank, so the profit from the bank, um, yeah, I can't do this whole translation. I don't want to do task in English. I, I think Minister. <laughs> but basically, if, if there's a loss, no dividends will be paid out, apparently, based on the article. Okay, so I can I understand you're reading statutes that are written in Dutch, so maybe yeah. you wanted to read it verbatim, but maybe you can just get an official translation and give it to the MP later. No problem. Where was I? Yeah, 14. Oh, no, I answered that. That was a dividend policy. The next question was, it is, not possible to, is it not possible to request an interim dividend? So for example, we have SLS, which I have spoken about a couple of times, that I can imagine have been seen the haven't seen the financials, but maybe I'm wrong, that it can, you can imagine that they made a profit over the last few years with the whole COVID pandemic. Um, you also asked, I said SLS, which according to the budget is 100% owned by government. According to the statute of SLS, the general shareholder meeting can be can decide after consultation with the supervisory board on profit reservations and dividends. However, based on the national ordinance on corporate governance, it is stimulated to have dividend policies in place, which we have sent. The reason behind the above is that the dividend should be based on responsible financial decision making for the company to have, for example, sufficient reserves and investment space. A dividend policy should be the tool to strengthen responsible dividend decision making. Next, due to an increase in the amount of loans, it is expected that the U.S. craving the right task for the payments will grow over the next few years. Can we get a prognosis over the next three years of terms of loans? Within the next three years, we will have to pay back principal payments, a total of 
415 million gillers, which consists of 316 million gillers, which will receive as liquidity support due date is October 2023. A bond of 73.5 million gillers due date is October 2025, and a, reg and a regular sinking bond totaling 25.4 million gillers split over the year 2023 and 2025. How the payback will look like that will actually be agreed upon is a, a is an outcome of the negotiations on sustainable financing. We are in discussion with the Basic Car right now. We expect the negotiations to come to an agreement by July 2023. Yeah, the next question statement was regarding um, blockchain, the use of blockchain. And the comments were also made that um, the parliament and the minister had no objection to using blockchain and actually um, was positive of blockchain in the past and this has changed and so forth. Um, MP, no, we, we are still in favor of the technology, the technology which is blockchain. Um, we do believe that this is the future in terms of um, technology and so forth, um, but it, it was not a priority for us in 2022, given the other priorities and so forth. Um, and yes, I am aware of the, of the blockchain technology and so forth that is happening in some of the other islands in the Caribbean. 18, in terms of capital expenditure, can I get a bit of explanation as to what the CFT's explanation currently for 2023 is or the expectation of what our debt to GDP ratio should be? In the advice on the draft by the 2023, CFT indicated that the debt to GDP ratio of St. Martin is 52%. In addition, CFT indicated that St. Martin is still in the interest burden rate of the NFT. With regard to the CAPEX, safety did not specifically indicate cap, a, cap, a cap for CAPEX. What it indicated is that in the past, is the indicated in the past is that the items for the CAPEX need to be explained better. In discussion with the CFT Secretariat, we came up with an agreed format, which is now included in the elucidation of the budget. MP made a few statements and um, comments regarding the latest fit ordering um, and specifically also the inspection. Um, the Ministry of Finance has been tasked by the Council of Ministers recently on forming the spearheading the team or committee to basically look at all the latest fit ordering within the government uh, with the other uh, ministries to have them uh, properly updated and bring a proposal to the Council of Ministers to then move on uh, forward. Um, and one of them would be the inspection, which is um, dated, I believe, to 1986, I believe. So that, yes, would be another way of generating revenues. In other countries, you update regularly these um, uh, latest for ordering to meet the current standards. And now move on to the question by MP Peterson. And that, of course, was in regards to the tender process, the, the tender law. Um, I'd like to say that we started this process um, uh, with the NRPB. Um, so we were working with the NRPB on, on getting this law up and running. In addition to that, we have started to also look on trainings. So we initiated that from the Ministry of Finance. We looked at what happened over the last few years in regards to tenders and so forth. So we're looking to train on a more professional level, different persons within different ministries on um, proper procurement processes and so forth. And what I would do then also is not that we have, for example, there's a tender of Rummy, and that doesn't necessarily mean you know, that only staff of Rummy will take part in this tender. We'll have a person from the Ministry of Finance, maybe AZ, and so forth, all persons that were trained properly in the tender process. I believe we have to submit about 20 names on government for this training. And um, I look forward to that process actually happening because I believe this will also help a lot when it comes to procurement.
in addition to that, we've looked at former uh, draft there's legislation that was that was there prior to World Bank. We also look at procurement processes, like I mentioned before, from NFB, and we're using this as a basis um, in addition to what was given by um, the Ministry of Rumi going forward. And now move on to the questions. And I believe the final MP, which is MP Lumina de Weaver. MP mentioned that the minister in, in his presentation had, you mentioned that the department are using an old system and part of an upgrade. And the capital expenditure that I see is 60 million gillers is related to the upgrade and revamp of the entire system. She just does, don't understand why they, they are not reflecting the budget as if it's not coming. Uh, yes, this is a question regarding CapEx and so forth. As per the, as per the compatibility ordinance, Article 4, funds received from the lens have to be accounted for in the budget as income and expenses related to this as ha has to be accounted for as an expense per the co correct function department. So, for example, you asked, you said that you, um, in the budget you see there's CapEx, there's income from the TBO on the income side. That's the fund of finance. And then there's also, I believe, income for the sewage. So the CapEx for the other ministries would be the loans that we have to get. The ones for finance, you see that's from the TBO. The next question was the expenses for finance um, regarding the Coursera and the academy costs. As I mentioned before, there's 108,000 guilders. Um, we chose SMDF to be our collaborator. Uh, the, the question, um, get some clarity, the question was why um, it was under the ministry. Next question was regarding the Minister of Finance. Maybe you'll be able to answer this for all ministries because when I go into the GL account questions, what you consistently see across the ministries when it comes to personal expenses per department is obviously we know the 12.5% was put back in. So you see the 12.5% increase for all departments, but then on this top row, you see a massive increase for all departments, but understand below the row, you see a massive decrease. This is for all the ministries. The answer, MP, assuming the MP is referring to vacation allowance in 2022, it was paid out and therefore taken up in the budget 2022 budget amendment. At the time of preparation, we only had the information per ministry available. It was decided to put it as a total line item under the staff of each ministry. In 2023, it is now taken up per department as intended. This is why an increase would be seen in each department and decrease in staff widow in the 2023 budget. Next question, how was policy-based budgeting reflected in 2023 budget? Please explain the reason for this being explicit, stated by you and the impact that it has on the budget. So positive or negative, why is it important for us to have this policy-based budgeting and whether or not every ministry has actually reflected it in that way? MP, and also like to, to note and thank you for your observations that you um, actually mentioned yesterday um, with the translation of the English version. We also have our staff updating that at the moment. So the one that was sent to Parliament, the Dutch version, um, policies do online and seemingly the English one doesn't. So we're having it translated properly as we speak. The policy-based budget results-based management is important as it will explain what is being done via the budget. Currently, via the country package, we are reviewing the budget process and also looking at what policy-based budget actually means for St. Martin. I also believe that the policy-based budget thing also gives the departments more insight into the reason why they're executing certain things and how uh, to actually look at the financial aspects of it, which wasn't really done in the past. 
Next question. Why is vacation allowance on zero in 2022? In 2022, the vacation allowance was paid out and therefore taken up in the 2022 budget amendment. At the time of preparation, we only had information per ministry available. It was decided to put it as a total line item under the staff of each ministry. However, this would be corrected in, in the year reckoning. The annual account as a proper allocation will be made there. Next, Minister, in your presentation, you mentioned that one of the departments still uses MS-DOS. What is the plan to upgrade and how much it is needed? Uh, what I mentioned was the software was made in DOS. And um, yes, that's the whole plan on upgrading the whole ERP system um, going forward. What we have done in, in, the, in the short term, though, um, to try to help the staff from suffering, stop suffering, um, is we've tried to tweak the software as much as possible to make it fa run faster and so forth, and also busy upgrading the hardware. Next question was already answered. That was regarding the CapEx. And last one by MP Limita the Weaver is, uh, was, why is the budget presenting items that are financed by NRPB, the Netherlands, TWO, RCG, or other entities outside of government? The funds from NRPB are also funds received via the Netherlands and also have to be accounted for on income and, ex and expense within the budget. And also, if you look at the budget of the Dutch government MP, you will see that they have the expense going out from their side to us. So that's why on our side, we have to also account for it, for it coming in. I now move on to the questions. And this is actually the last MP, not MP De Weaver, sorry. MP George Pantaflet. The instructions placed on government in 2015 to 2019, what is the process update with regard to these instructions? On September 8, 2015, that time the government received an instruction based on Article 13 of the Kingdom Act Financial Supervision Correspondent St. Martin. The instruction basically instructed to one, the payment arrears, two, compensate budget deficit, three, budget your health and pension costs, and four, reform your health and pension system. After the hurricane and during the COVID pandemic, most parts of these instructions were hard to follow up on, but we did a few. MP, you, asked, you, you mentioned that insurance will be increased by 15%, and will this be taken up in the budget? We have um, already gotten the insurance um, uh, invoices, for lack of better words. I don't believe included the fifteen percent. So yes, it will be taken up in future budgets. Is there a policy dividend? Is there a dividend policy? I mentioned that a few times already. MP, there is a dividend policy approved by the council of ministers that has been distributed and shared with all the government-owned entities and even some foundations that associate with the government. Mr. Chairman. That is all the questions and answers, and I look forward to clarifications. Thank you, uh, Minister, for the answers to those questions in this first part of the Central Committee. Uh, members of Parliament, I will now give the floor to other members, to other members who have further clarifications and questions uh, before we move on to the next minister. I have MP Westcott Williams next. Thank you. Chairman, and a good afternoon. My thanks to the minister for the responses provided. And without wanting to belabor the issue, I think this discussion regarding the realistic nature or not of the budget numbers, I think warrants more of an explanation or review than the minister indicated. So let me again ask the minister for his take on the following, and this has to do with the point raised, my reference to the minister's statement last night and the minister's response earlier to my reference. In, if we look strictly at the 2022 budget, 
and the actuals in 2022, personnel cost in general would be lower than budgeted. 20 million approximately lower than budgeted. What is the cause of, for example, that differentiation between budget and actual? Is it one, that the vacancies could not be filled because we didn't have the capacity to recruit in time? One, is it because of finances that, like I heard a minister say yesterday, rather than take on someone for a year, we could only take them on for half a year in 2023? So it cannot be so, in my opinion, and this was my reference to the minister's statement, that because personnel in 2022 turned out for 20 million guilders less than budgeted, that mean that a reduced amount is the actual number for us to go by in 2023. So if the minister can give an indication, because we seem to be in a, in a vicious circle. We had the money budgeted in 2022, but for whatever reason, um, funding, capacity to recruit persons or whatever else, we could not expend what was budgeted for personnel. And so there are many others because we were below the budget in terms of our expenditures. So if the minister can go into it from that angle then. Minister, I, I heard your, and I was a little disappointed in your answer regarding the questions and the oblig obligation placed on you to, in consultation with the CBCS take certain measures as far as Mullet Bay is concerned. What was my disappointment? Because Minister, while I ask you these questions as part of the budgetary proceedings you refer, which I did by the way, to a previous letter sent on the same issue and you indicated that I will receive these answers by letter. So Minister, I'm gonna ask you a related question now and if you can answer it now. The, the, in the case of um, the Mullet Bay Motion Minister, you were asked, and that is from uh, January, you were asked to undertake action in collaboration with the CBCS in order to postpone whatever action the CBCS will be or has been undertaking regarding Mullet Bay. And so I ask you, Minister, since that motion, what actual steps have you undertaken to execute the motion? So what have you done? Have you written? Have you contacted? Have you checked as to the legality in terms of doing whatever? What have you done as far as that motion of, uh, that would be um, seven, uh, no, more, um, since January the 20th in any case? That's, that's one clarification I would like you to give. Mr. Chairman, am I to understand from the Minister of Finance that he does not have, as Minister of Finance, an overview of the monies from the Dutch government in connection with the country package in totality? I heard the amounts given for the Ministry of Finance, 22 million and 5 million, but overall, the Minister referred that to the Prime Minister. As Minister of Finance, therefore, is my question, do you not have the total overview of the money, the monies which are expected for all of the ministries as part of the country package from the Dutch government? MP, MP Westcott Williams? Yes. Um, the Minister did want a brief break, and I wasn't sure how many more questions you had, so I want to just adjourn for three minutes. Okay, and then sure, allow because you to I have continue. a few more, sure. Okay, meeting adjourned for three minutes.
Welcome back. And I give the floor to MP Sarah Westcott Williams to continue. MP Westcott, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I continue. So just following up, I stopped at asking the minister what he has done with respect to the motion from Parliament regarding uh, instruction slash communication to the central bank as far as their actions with respect to Mullet Bay are concerned. And then, in fact, I think I had even started the following question, and yes, I did, and that was to ask the minister if he does not have the information for the other ministries in terms of the monies to be expected from the Dutch government in the context of the country package. Only, I have received only the information regarding the Ministry of Finance for 22, plus five, 22 million plus 5 million guilders. Unlike what the minister indicated, uh, Mr. Chairman, no, I did not get the explanation on the health slash visitors tax from the minister as far as the budgeted amount is concerned. So what is the, what is the 10 million based on that? that? That is what I wanted to know from the Minister of Finance. And the other part of my question, which the Minister of Finance should be able to answer, is whether this money will be earmarked to go to the social fund or funds. So the money from the health visitors tax, whether it's earmarked to go to the social fund or funds. The, the, my question regarding the lotteries also had to do with the issue of the three million and what was that calculated on? The minister referred to the TIAT ministry and my question therefore is whether I would get the explanation of the amount from the minister of TIAT as well. If that is the case, then I will ask. With respect to the casinos and the payments and the budgeted amount, the minister indicated that CFT has been advising to remove the TOT from casinos, but the, the CFT has also been advising of a casino tax, casino ballasting. So what exactly is the proposal from the CFT where this is concerned? Are they suggesting to remove the TOT and replace it with something? Are they suggesting to increase the casino fees as they are right now? What is, what is the proposal? The, the minister indicated, Mr. Chairman, that the Airbnb amount budgeted of five million is based on collections for 2022, if I understood him correctly. And, and how, oh, that is not the case. Okay, so then what is it based on? Because that was my question. The, what is the amount based on? And I hear what the minister is going to do and get an uh, overview of exactly the properties, et cetera, but what is that based on? I had asked if the dividend policy slash framework could be provided to Parliament as well. The minister indicated where it's at, but did not go into the question about receiving that. The, the, the minister indicated that the vehicle inspection from the budget in 2021, approximately 34,000 guilders was collected. The minister responded to my question as to how much was collected in 2022, about 25,000, I think. And, the minister, and now I need to ask the minister, so the amount now budgeted for 2023, for approximately 480,000 guilders. That came from the Ministry of TIAT and the Minister of Finance cannot give the, uh, an explanation as to that increase and whether it means that some type of new program or what have you will be instituted as far as the vehicle inspection is concerned. The matter of the, the, matter of the CAPEX, the minister indicated that 2022 was approved and is now included in the 2023 budget, but I had asked what exactly are the steps now? Are the steps to be taken to get um, a, a sort of a, a mandate for the total amount budgeted for CAPEX, or 
does the do the individual ministries still have to provide a proposal per object of the capex in order to get the financing slash the loan mr chairman those are the matters i would ask the minister to please clarify based on his answers given i thank you thank you mp westcott <clears throat> the next person i see is mp ludmila de weaver mp de weaver you have the floor Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Um, thank you to, good afternoon, everyone, once again. Thank you to the minister for the answers, because um, exactly what I was looking for was an explanation of why the inconsistent use of accounts when it came to, to showing what we did in 2022 with the 12.5% cut and then how it's reflected in each department level. So I think it was just for the ease of the estimation is what the minister explained, which for me is, is sufficient for now because it was just to maintain consistency across the accounts. Um, so that is that is fine and I expect then, you know, when the other ministers come, it will be the same thing for them and that, that is more than sufficient for at this time. The, there was a question from MP Westcott Williams, I believe, which the minister answered in reference to the concession fees paid in 2022. So I just wanted clarification when the minister mentioned GB, if I'm correct. I just wanted to confirm that the 2022 concession, so the minister said that GB paid in 2022. I just wanna find out if that is the 2022 concession amount from GB that was physically paid out in 2022. That's it for me, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, <coughs> MP D. Weaver. The next person is MP Christopher Emanuel. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I only have two clarifications for the minister. And the first one is relating to the loans that I made mention of the 316 million. You, you, you said that the loans are there in the budget in a specific location, but you also made mention that it, you, you still have to have a discussion with, okay, yeah, I just want you to clarify that a bit for me because you said nothing hasn't been done with it as yet, and you still have to have that discussion. That's the first clarification, Mr. Chairman. And the second one is also the last one that I asked concerning the three balance budget and what is what is in the law. You was you were speaking about it in Dutch. So I didn't really the central the cent yeah yeah on the central bank, yeah. So I want a, I want a clarification on that slowly. Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much. Thank you, MP Emmanuel. The next person is MP Melissa Gums. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just, I just had one question for the minister. It's more on a, a health and uh, cleanliness of the budget question. Um, into, like, I wanted to ask what work has been done to kind of undertake to a, sort of a clean up what might look to me as a discrepancy that appears in the budget. Um, for example, and if I have to redirect this to the Minister of Justice, that's fine. Um, in the section, Deans for Lanings Over Incomes to Under Justice, there's 10,000 guilders for Mercury Health and 60,000 for Midtown Medical, but essentially those are the same company. Um, one is the, the registered name of the chamber and the other is the trade name of the doing business, business as name. So I just wanted to ask if that is done on purpose or is that a discrepancy because it, it comes across like sloppy accounting. Um, to have those two um, contradicting names. So if the minister could just give some clarity on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, MP Gums. The next person I see is MP Grisha Heiliger Martin. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> just a clarity maybe um, regarding my question that I posed to the minister regarding the prognosis, the financial prognosis. Indeed, yes, we did receive the um, report, uh, the quarterly report on the IS-468, I believe. And from what I've got it, it's like an interview after the fact. It's like an overview after the fact. So the, the key word is implementation. It clearly amplifies it's um, after the fact. Uh, liquidity is mainly a prognosis. It's a, um, before the fact. So 
if the minister can, is some, I want to know if the minister has any type of report indicating the anticipation of what, how liquid we are in the coming months. Do you have any reports like that that can assist us? Um, uh, just for clarity's sake, thank you. Thank you, MP Grisha Harliger Martin. The next person is MP George Pantaflip. MP George. Press it again. MP George, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon to the Chair, my colleague in Parliament, Okrifir, of course, our Minister of Finance and the support staff and those that are viewing. Just one clarification, Mr. Chairman, through you to the Minister of Finance. I believe in the response, the Minister of Finance stated that um, when it comes to the issue of concession fees, that GB paid 6.5, or sorry, yes, GB paid 6.4 million guilders, and the harbor paid 4 million guilders. Um, what I need clarity on, Mr. Chairman, is that according to the concession fees, is it not a fixed amount that each company has to pay? If you understand my question. If it's not a fixed amount, because it's mentioned GB paid 6.4 and the harbor paid 4 million, I want to know whether it is not a fixed uh, fee that has to be paid when it comes to the concession fees. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP George Fantaflet. No further clarification or question. Minister, I just have one clarity to clarification to point out. My question two <clears throat> was not answered. The English version of the explanatory note mentions CRIFF insurance on page 12 as 2.7 million guilders for insurance. And on page 20, it says that it's been taken care by trust fund. Could you clarify whether the insurance amount is budgeted or not? I believe most of the MPs have asked their questions and I will look at to the minister. How long would you need to write away? I'll have to adjourn the meeting this no quorum. Meeting adjourned for 10 minutes.
Good afternoon once again, honorable members of parliament, ministers, and others viewing this meeting. The minister is uh, ready with the answers to the two clarifications that were posed earlier today, and I now give the floor to the Minister of Finance, Artwell Arian. Yes, thank you, MP. I, as I indicated earlier, I'll try to answer as much as possible from what I know from the top of my head already. Um, I'll start with MP De Weaver. Um, MP De Weaver asks about the concession fees from GB. So what we typically do is we offset. So we have this amount to pay to GB, and we offset with the, with the concession. So in regards to how much was paid, I don't have the exact amount now, but I know what we typically do is offset because the amount that we have to pay them typically is very, very close to the, the concession. And with that same answer, MP George also asked a question regarding the concessions and the different entities. No, every entity has their own concession. So it's not that it's a fixed amount for all entities. Every entity has their own concession. Um, <coughs> MP Melissa Gums, I honestly don't have the answer in regards to Mercury and so forth. That's really a justice um, question. So we've taken note of it and we'll pass it along unless you ask again when the minister arrives. Um, MP Biljani in regards to CRIF, yes, the, two, the, the money for CRIF is in the budget because we have to pay it. So, yeah, we have to pay it. Um, MP Sarah Westcott Williams. MP asked a question in regards to, I'm, I'm not seeing it, but I know MP asked a question regarding inspection, right? That was another MP. No, inspection. Huh? Was inspection? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, the increase in inspection from uh, the amount from last year to this year, you said it was a jump of 408,000 guilders. This um, is because the ministry is in the process of updating the legislation and so forth, um, and the fees amount. So that, uh, the assignment was from the Ministry of, the ministry of Finance, or the Ministry of Finance, so all the ministries was, you know, we can't afford to continue cutting, cutting, cutting. It's, it's not the most realistic thing for us to do. What we have to do also is start to generate revenues. Right, so these are these are this is our budget, right? If we want to spend more, we have to generate more, and we look at other areas where we have outdated laws, legislations, and so forth. Other areas where we have fees, um, and so forth. That we could, uh, in the short term, basically quick wins in terms of revenue generating, and that was one of the areas which they predicted and they sent a whole proposal for it already um, to possibly be implemented in the second quarter. So that's where that came from. Um, regarding the person, um, the personnel budget, um, it's different factors. MP, um, I think I answered already in in, in one of them. Um, yes, what we did, for example, is not budget the whole year. So, for example, every um, we have twelve months. We say, look, we're gonna zero out from month one to six because typically the pay no process, the person that fails profit process takes so long, right, that you over budget by saying, um, by putting six months in personnel when, you, when you, you won't get the individual in the office until six months after and so forth. So you mentioned a couple, a couple of reasons, actually a lot of reasons that you mentioned were the reasons. And, and personnel, um, finding personnel is one. Second, the process of hiring an individual um, is another. In regards to Central Bank, um, the motion was shared with Central Bank, and a letter of comments with the motion will be sent within short. But the motion has already been sent to Central Bank from my cabinet. Um, regarding the lotteries of three million guilders, um, the Ministry of Tiat, and that's why we referred back to Tiat because it, it was their initiative, um, started, uh, created a policy or legislation to actually have every lottery booth um, pay their fair share in terms of uh, like a, a lottery permit. So a, 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 a sort of a, not a branch license, but a, a, a basically, I will, for lack of better words, a franchise area. So you have every location then pays their own their own fee. So that's, that was their 
revenue generating aspect. It was also one of my concerns, actually, coming into government on seeing the amount of lottery boots we have, but also making sure that they have a legal basis to operate. And that was one of the um, instructions given to TIAC to ensure that um, that was done. In regards to CFT advice to remove TOT um, and a casino tax, it basically goes from um, um, removing the exemption from the, from the TOT and including um, casinos in, as part. So you're going from casino fees to TOT, so taxing them on TOT. You've asked if you could get a dividend policy slash framework. Yes, MP, you can, you can have that. Um, I'll, we'll try our best to provide that to you before the public meeting. I'm trying to see this one. Yes, in regards to the the health tax, a portion um, is not finalized, but the discussions currently are that a portion will be earmarked or dedicated towards the name of the OZR, the back payment of SFV, and there's another discussion on um, increasing the budget of TIAT and so forth um, so that they can execute specific um, projects, and then the rest um, will be going to the general coffers. And then we have increasing inspection, MP Christoph Emmanuel. Uh, MP mentioned that, uh, uh, had concerns regarding the 360 million guilders, the loans that we have to pay. And you said that I mentioned the loans are in the budget and also mentioned that there's a discussion. Yes, um, currently the loans are in the budget that we have to pay um, um, due in October. So we have to budget it. And that's why I also mentioned though that we have to have a final discussion. So um, uh, the three islands, Aruba, Corsa, and St. Martin, all have um, been in, in discussions actually the last couple of weeks regarding these loans, what the possibilities are on grants, uh, debt cancellation, um, every island has their position. St. Martin's position has been debt cancellation, forgiveness, and so forth. Um, and uh, our, our um, other position also is, um, just, just for information's sake, is that we are at um, a 52% debt to GDP ratio. Our is a lot higher, closer to 100 and Curacao is, I believe, between 80 and 90. So we could actually take on a little bit more depth in terms of being able to negotiate and so forth. Um, so that's also something that we, are, we have included in our negotiations. But yes, we have to have these discussions because we have to know what are we doing in October, what decision is going to be made. Um, at the very, very least, um, a, postponed, a postponed of payment has to happen, so a, a grace period. So you push the loans back to the next year, for example. Um, but we had to put in the budget because at the end of the day, we do have these loans. So by the end of July, we should have an answer but in, uh, from our discussions with the, the two other islands and the Netherlands on what are we going to do about these loans. Um, currently, as I mentioned before, the Ministry of Bezeka in our discussions, in the, our fight um, for debt cancellation, they've indicated that for the year 2023, um, it's not an option for them because on, they have to have a budget neutral budget. So on their budget, if you say we have budget, if you have debt cancellation, that then um, it's not budget neutral on their end. So uh, they've already indicated that to all the islands that um, we can have these discussions and um, they, they, they have stated their position for 2023. Um, They've also asked for us to have um, our economic outlook um, of, the, of the next three, three to five years um, to be included in these discussions to see where we're at in our ability to pay and so forth. So that's, that's all the discussions, part of the discussions we're having. But to clarify again, yes, the money's on the budget, as I mentioned, because we have to put in a budget because it's due in October. 
Um, next question from MP Emanuel was regarding the three balanced budgets and what is in the law. So I'll just read what's in the law. Based on Article 33 of the Kingdom Act Financial Supervision, Curso and St. Martin, five years after 10, 10, 10, and then after three years, a committee evaluates if the financial supervision can be withdrawn, limited, or continued. Based on evaluation report, the Kingdom Council of Ministers decides on the financial supervision. The last evaluation was ex executed by the Evaluation Committee, NFT 2021, and this report is stated, in addition to an opinion on compliance with the standards from Article 15 of the NFT, the committee also indicates in its opinion whether Article 25 of the NFT was in force in the relevant years. The fact that Article 25 is in force means that it is allowed to deviate from part of the standards of, in Article 15 due to extraordinary events. Irrespective of applicability of Article 25, the committee finds that the countries have not complied with the standards of Article 15. The committee is aware that the extraordinary events leading to the entry into force of Article 25 play an important role in limiting factor in complying with the standards of Article 15. Yes, and I'll move on to the question from clarifications from, from MP Grisha Helga Martin. Her clarification was regarding financial prognosis after the fact, so liquidity is before the fact, not after the fact. Those were the comments made by the MP. That is correct. The financial prognosis are indicated in the quarterly report. Actually, the quarterly report include a liquidity projection for the relevant year. So the quarterly report for the first quarter of 2023 will include a liquidity projection for the total year of 2023, which I don't believe you've gotten as yet. And MP Biljani, I believe I have answered all the clarification. Uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Chairman. I believe I've answered all the clarifications. Okay. Thank you, Minister, for those clarifications. And this is, uh, can you turn off the mic? Yes. Um, as this is your second time presenting here in the Central Committee, if um, there are no further questions, then I will adjourn this meeting for a few minutes. Do you have further questions? Okay, then I will have MP, uh, which one went first? Which one was first? MP Westcott-Williams? Okay, MP Westcott-Williams, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank the minister for responding to the clarification questions. The, I, will, I will leave one or two that were not answered. I'll leave that for um, probably the public meeting, but I would like the minister to take along in terms of questions now, the following. Under many of the services, the issue of personnel van derden, third party personnel is mentioned. I see some of them and for a considerable amount also in the individual cabinets of ministers. I think one of my colleagues alluded to it, but I didn't get the, the complete answer. So my question is, where in the cabinets you have third party personnel? Is that based on cabinet positions or is it based on a certain expertise that then the, in the cabinets of the individual ministers would bring into their cabinet. So if you get my question, I have a question, uh, question that I posed to the, I believe to the prime minister about the policy on cabinet personnel. And now specifically, because I think in your cabinet too, minister, you have third party personnel. Is the third party personnel, personnel van derden, is that based on the cabinet staffing policy, or is it based on a certain expertise that the ministers are seeking to bring in to their cabinet? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's the additional question I wanted to pose. Thank you. Um, I'll just go to MP Manuel, and then we'll answer the questions. MP Manuel, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have a few questions for the minister. I'm going to get right into them. Minister is concerning the central bank and the new currency. My first question is, 
what is the projected cost of the new currency for the islands from the Central Bank of Curacao and St. Martin? What is St. Martin portion? And where is the money coming from for the making of this new currency? How and who are the ones responsible for the decision to create a new currency? And was St. Martin involved in the discussion of the creation of this new currency? In the making of this new currency, will the rate remain the same as it is right now, as we know, 1.80, 1.77, 1.76, etc., etc., etc. With the issuing of new, with the issuing of anything new comes a cost, and most times it's passed on to the people. Are there any hidden costs in relations or relating to this new currency? Any cost? Approximately how much is collected from the withdrawal of dollars from your account, meaning when we go to the machine and we withdraw dollars, that 1% goes, how much is, is collected annually from that? And also, relating to that question, what is the responsibility of the Central Bank of Curacao and St. Martin in collecting this money, meaning are they the ones managing this fund? Are they the ones collecting this fund? What is their relation, what is their responsibility in collecting this money? Who benefits? Or what is the benefit for St. Martin in collecting or getting this money, this 1% from the machines that we collect when we withdraw dollars? Also, for the years of this collection, so I'm asking, when did it start? When did it start in terms of we are going to collect this 1%? When did it start? And in the years of this collection, do we have a total amount thus far? as how many years is being done now? Do we have a total amount from time the inception of collecting to present? Do we have a total amount now? And also, Minister, I believe you made mention of it. I think it was 75 million, you said. How much was the bond that you wanted to float for St. Martin during the time when liquidity was needed? I believe you answered that question when you said 75 million, so yes, okay. What is the current value of St. Martin portion of the Central Bank of Kerosene and St. Martin in terms of the gold reserves, the value of the shares, the value of assets, intellectual name, or anything relating to St. Martin? Does the Central Bank of Kerosene and St. Martin input any finances in the annual budget of Curacao? If yes, can you explain how much? and the reason for such. Coming on to the end, Minister. Who regulate the ATM bank cards and swipe machines used on the island? Or is there any regulations needed for such? But through you, Mr. Chairman, most of these questions will come in the, in the OV. But I just wanted to ask this one now specifically in terms of the machines that is used when you go and you have to swipe and the bank cards that you receive, the debit cards that you receive that you have to swipe, if there's any regulations or anything regulating needing them. The reason why I'm asking that, Mr. Chairman, because it's crazy when, we exp when I can explain, but that will be for the OV. In clarification, you made mention that a committee evaluates the role of the, of the, of the, the having three budgets. Which committee is that? And who is on the board of that committee? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Emmanuel. Um, Minister, uh, you want to answer right away? Yeah? Or, yeah. Yes, I'll first start with MP Sarah Williams uh, regarding the personnel van der de, um, consultancy from the different cabinets. Um, regarding the Ministry of Finance, I'll speak for the Ministry of Finance. We did it based on expertise, and we actually also did a tender process. Um, typically, it was directly under the minister, and the minister chooses for also for professional reasons and privacy and so forth, um, their consultant. But uh, for the cabinet, um, we did a, a tender process, and that was based on expertise. But I think also typically what I've seen within the different cabinets that has been the case. 
MP Christoph Emanuel. I think every year I get a question on the collection of what is the responsibility of central bank in collecting this money? I had the same question last time. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll start with the currency. Um, you know, as a comment that MP Rayon Peterson makes regarding uh, legislation that has been implemented and so forth, actually going over to this currency is actually something that will be agreed upon um, in, be in becoming country C. Martin, right? So since 10, 10, 10, we actually had to go over to um, going from a, going from a Nez Antilles Gilder to this new currency. So actually, we are and we are not um, we are not complying. Yes, thank you uh, with what we agreed upon since 10, 10, 10. So regarding that, um, what is the Samaritan uh, regarding the cost? Um, yes, there's a cost, obviously, to create a new currency, but it's also a cost of having the old currency. Um, the old currency, there's, uh, I believe, one, uh, let me see, very few um, companies in the world that still wants to even print on this, this type of paper. Right? It's becoming very dated. It's very expensive to continue printing on this type of paper. Um, yes, I, I, this certain thing that I, I can't, huh? and, the, and the coins, but also, um, Technology-wise, right? So going to a new currency um, is a lot more uh, secure going forward. That's the word I'll, I'll, I'll use for now, and I'll maybe explain a little bit um, off air why. Um, so yes, there is a cost um, to have a new currency, but it's even but it is also a cost by keeping this old currency. Cost to keep it running, and you don't want to run into a point where it cannot even be produced anymore. But again, going back to our obligation that we have to comply with what we agreed to going into our current status. Will the, will the rate remain the same? Yes, the rate will be the same. It just goes from um, NAF to Caribbean Gilder. Um, projected costs. Um, and to have, the, to, to have a couple of these more specific questions, I would like to maybe send it in writing um, by, um, before OVE. Um, so I answer the ones I know from the top of my head already. Um, a committee evaluates the, a committee evaluates the NFT. Yes, there is a committee. Um, the committee, the report, uh, um, I believe, was sent to share the parliament. I will share it again before the OVE. I'll make sure you share it again with, with um, Parliament. And I believe that St. Martin had the strongest points in terms of um, how we saw this process. And I actually, I, I agree with a lot of the points of the, of the evaluation. So I believe if we actually, um, if the, the kingdom looks at this evaluation and we follow through, I think it's more in our interest than not in the last, last evaluation. I also understood three years ago, that the last time we had to have the evaluation, St. Martin didn't even put a member up so um, to be part of that committee. So it was not in our best interest at that point in time. Let me see if anything else I can answer from the top. A point of order from MP Emanuel? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have a point of order. I have no problem setting the minister the exact questions in writing, and he can answer them. Uh, he can reply them back to me in writing before the OVA. That would be much appreciated. Instead of going through them like this, I would send them to him in writing as they are, and he can respond to them, respond to me back in writing. I thank you. A very you. rare occasion, but I will. I would take that in consideration given the time. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thought it would be because so, I. The, Try my best the MP has is agreed to send you those in writing, and you agree to send them back in writing before the public meeting as well. Excluding the ones I answered already, obviously. Yes. yes. Um, and I see MP George Pantaflet. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have I have several, but I'll just ask one. Um, the Dutch government gave us a grant of $650 million, I believe. Um, in connection with Hurricane Irma. 
funds have been deposited on Central Bank, Central Bank of Curacao St. Martin account for us, I, if I'm not mistaken. During a meeting, I think it was in 2021, it was said that the interest earned on those funds was something like $21 million at the time. And I believe it was also said that that fund was there for projects or whatever. I can't remember because it was about two, three years ago, so I'm trying to uh, make sure I ask it correctly. From that time to now, how much interest has been accumulated in that account? And what kind of access do we, as St. Martin government, have to those funds and to use for what purpose? If my question is understood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, MP Pantaflet. Um, Minister, I do also have uh, three clarifications I wanted to state, and my answers you can also give me in writing. I, I'm fine with that. Uh, while you work on the answer from MP George Pantaflet. Um, Regarding the need for a dividend policy, the, men the minister mentioned it's something to be worked on and that uh, on advice of, I believe it was the Corporate Governance Council, that that should be done first. However, my question was more about an interim dividend. What I mean by that is if there is a situation where a government-owned entity obviously has a significant amount of profit or liquidity, would it not be possible to still have that entity, especially considering our own financial position to give some sort of interim dividend, for lack of a better term, pending a sort of dividend policy. So for example, if we had an entity that had $10 million and they have no plans for further investments or so on, um, I'm given a bit of an exaggerated situation, but I would imagine that it probably wouldn't kill the company if you're able to get a half a million or a million or something like that. That's what I'm trying to assess in the meantime. Regarding blockchain, Minister, I must say it is a bit of a pity it's not called a priority. Um, you did mention that there are, um, you, you noticing what other islands are doing, and I think in order for us to be competitive, we should try to prioritize this more in terms of the use of the technology. Um, we see the advancements in AI and how a lot of that is going into blockchain as well, um, but I will handle that further in, in the public meeting. Uh, regarding the question about the um, the capital expenditures, you mentioned that we're at 52%, and according to the CFT, uh, we're, we're within the burden rate, I think is the term you used, um, but that they didn't really set a cap. So am I to understand um, the general rule of thumb with regards to CapEx is that it should be properly justified, properly explained, fits within the governing program and government policies, and it should be financially feasible. And generally, if it qualifies for that, then that's how it makes it to CapEx. Okay, thank you for that, Ms. Um, Minister. Um, with that, members of parliament, I okay. um, So with that, Minister, I, uh, you're going to answer the one question that's outstanding and then send the other questions to myself and MP Emanuel in writing. Then we move to the next minister. Thank you for your questions, MP George Pantaflet. And regarding um, your questions, so basically, just for clarification, uh, you can just nod for clarification. So the, the trust fund received 650 million um, money. They didn't execute one time, right? So they, the money was at the World Bank, so it generated inter interest, let's say 10, 20 million. You're asking if it continued to generate interest over the period of time, yes? So it did, as, um, recently even, it did generate more interest um, during the last year as inflation rose and um, interest rates also rose. Um, that means the interest rate got higher, so but in the last six months, or maybe even a little more, um, a significant interest did um, build up on the account. Um, that interest um, has been offset or is being um, looked to be offset on projects that were running a deficit or needed more money, right? So um, during that same period of time, construction also increased, the cost of construction also increased and so forth. So at a time where we as a, as a government had to look at um, which projects may maybe not have made it um, because of um, lack of um, extra funding, um, we now can look at how much interest has been developed um, to put towards these projects. And now MP, um, Rolanda Bryson, 
regarding your statements on blockchain, I said in 2022, uh, it was a priority for us. Um, unfortunately, we had other priorities, um, but we can potentially look in 2023 for a small project or so. Regarding the dividend policy for SLFs, uh, you're specific on, on your policy. Um, once the shareholder and the board agrees on the policy, um, that is possible, yes, uh, on a sort of a... No, so, no, no, so, so once that decision is made, it becomes the policy then of, of, to execute. So, so it's not that there's a dividend policy that's drafted across the board. No. It is per case by case per company. Yes. Okay, that, that makes it clearer. Thank you. No, so he's asking, MP's asking to, if the board can make a decision. So there's a surplus of money. If the board can make a decision to say, look, we want to, actually every entity right now can create their own dividend policy. We created a draft framework that we want to, to, to look at and see themselves in. But every company could have done it already or, and still can do that. So yes, they can um, decide, look, we have the surplus. We want to give back to the, the shareholder and we want to start with this dividend policy and we want to have this, this is our first payment while we work on, on this policy. But can it be the other way around, that the shareholder requests looking at their financials for an, uh, some sort of interim dividend? Yes, so based on the particular statutes of SLS, yes, this, um, the, shareholder, the shareholder can, yes. Okay, Minister, I would like to thank you for answering the questions of when this central committee meeting. Members of Parliament, we'll take an adjournment for five minutes to allow the next minister to join us. Meeting adjourned for five minutes.
Good afternoon once again, members of parliament, uh, viewing public, and honorable minister of health, Omar Atli. Welcome back to the Central Committee meeting. The minister has returned to answer uh, questions posed initially within the Central Committee meeting, and I now give him the floor. Thank you. Press the button. Oh, yeah. Got it. Thank you once again, Mr. Chair. Members of parliament, I'll go right into the questions, um, the clarification round. The reparation legislation for SFA has been sent to the set. This is by MP Sarah Westcott. What um, are the objectives? It was sent, first of all, January 2023. The following subjects are to regulate the draft ordinance of formalizing the cross financing between various funds, creating a legal bas basis for medical referrals abroad, formalizing the 62 plus insurance for pensioners, optimizing and organizing structure of SLV, expanding the pool of insured persons, which is adding the sole proprietorships, sole proprietors. MP Westcott's second question was the GHI. Um, it was said that it is at Council of Advice and wanted an overview. The overall objective of the GHI is to ensure sustainable, affordable access to health care and wellness for every citizen living slash working on St. Martin. The intended outcome of the project is a situation in which every member of St. Martin society has access to quality, affordable health care, be it cure, care, or prevention, in a system that is sustainable, that is sustainably financed. To achieve this, repairs to the current financing of care and access to health insurance have to be implemented in legislation. The financial models indicate alleviation of the pressures on the public sector, amongst which no need for cross-funding from AOV funds. Implementation of tools to manage the funds better and to promote quality of care. What is the duration of the contract for the transitional shelter? The agreement has, has a duration of three years in which is subject to annual evaluation to determine whether the services are still required. The services provided are counseling, summer program for children, case management, also empowerment programs such as budgeting, gardening program, assisting, assistance with pursuance of employment, assistance with writing a CV and house assistant. The monthly fee is 131,000 guilders, 840 guilders, allocated towards operational costs and 53,000 guilders, which is allocated towards services provided. The MP asked about the OZR chart. Yes, it will be sent to you, MP. Also, the MP asked for an overview on SRV regarding the different funds and how financially sound are they. We are still awaiting this information, but it will be sent along with the answers to the MP and the members of parliament. As is an agreement with the AOC still on AUC still ongoing. And in this was relation to the Ministry of VSR not having a policy for medical schools. No, there is no policy. However, the Ministry of VSA and the American University of the Caribbean School of Medicine have entered into a collaboration agreement which has become effective from February 11, 2016 and is currently still in effect. And, uh, yeah. There's no other arrangement at the moment with any other medical schools at the moment. Does the minister have any current formation regarding the mixed matching of unemployed? We presented an entire chart for the members of parliament, but just to give an overview, um, the top 10 registered functions, I would just list the top five, cooks, maids, teachers, electricians, steel makers. The top 10 desired functions by the job seeker, administrative assistants, so I'll list the top five as well, cashiers, warehouse assistants, waitresses, and cleaners. So there's a disparity within the top 10 functions that are requested from job seekers and top 10 functions that are requested from the employers. All of this is provided in data 
and it will be submitted to the members of parliament. Is there a proposed increase in the AOV pension? So this was based on me saying that the legislation is at the Council of Advice. So the legislation itself for the AOV is separate. What is at the Council of Advice is the, um, I mean, the increase is separate, the legislation, the advice for the increase. The legislation is at the Council of Advice because the problem is that at, um, the legislation specifically requires the CPI of August. We no longer use monthly CPIs, we use quarterly. The Netherlands, St. Martin, everyone, we use quarterly CPI. So originally the ministry proposed the advice using the third quarter CPI and it was not able to be signed off. Therefore, we needed a trajectory of amending the legislation of the AOV itself. So we have amended it from saying August CPI to now second quarter CPI, which was advised by the said in previous advice and the council in previous advice that the second quarter gives us enough time to make adjustments for the, for the next coming year. So we took the advice and it's now at the council of advice. It went to the said, it went to the calm, now at the council of advice. So once this is back, we will then bring it to the members of parliament in which we hope that it can pass so we can increase finalize the increase of the AOV pension. Is the minister aware of the comments from TIAT ministry regarding the lottery advice of the said? As minister, I have only received this report recently and the ministry is busy reviewing it. MP Gums, the second part of the said report regarding substance abuse and addiction. The ministry is currently reviewing the recommendations and are busy determining what aspects will be taken up. We are busy exploring ways to define addiction and how addiction would be addressed in the policy and legislation. MP Bryson, you didn't have questions, but you made more comments on the French side having a solidarity, solidarity tax. We thank you for that information. We did indeed see the information and we'll take it up in our uh, motivation for the health levy, as well as yes, we do concur that the CFT has advised indeed to input any projections within the budget. So you are correct with these specifications. It is there written, the advice from the CFT is clear on that aspect. Thank you, Minister. Uh, members of Parliament, uh, I know MP Emmanuel has some further questions. And uh, I'll go to MP Emmanuel next. Keep in mind, we're trying to take a nice soup break at six. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Just about four questions I have for the minister. As much as I told him, I had none for him. But for the OVA, I decided to throw a few of them at him. Minister, I'll get right into the questions. I would like to know the current amount of money granted to the hospital from the World Bank. I would like to know how much that is. I would also like to know what's the original price tag for the hospital. And Mr. Chairman, through you to the Honorable Minister, when the King was here and he had a tour of the hospital, the hospital made mention that they need 50% plus. The King himself was shocked when he said 50%. I would like to know through you, Mr. Chairman, to the Honorable Minister, how much is this 50% and the plus that is needed for the completion of the hospital? and how much is spent already specifically on the Hospital Foundation. That's it. I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, okay. MP Emanuel. I look to the floor to see if there are any further questions, but I see none. Minister, do, are you able to answer? Right, no? Not off the top of my head and knowing MP Emanuel, I want to come with um, figures, because most of the time he's going to say, I have them right here, so that's why okay. I ask you. So, <laughs> So then, uh, if, you'll, if you allow me, I'd like to um, come send them in writing for the OVA. Uh, before the OVA, you will have them in writing. The, the MP does agree to that? Okay. So with that then, um, we will receive some additional question, answers to questions from MP Emmanuel before the public handling of this meeting. Uh, and then with that, we can conclude the Ministers of ASR portion of this Central Committee meeting. Minister, I thank you for your participation. Members of Parliament, we will adjourn until 6.30 p.m.
um, while we have a break for supper, and then we will follow with the Minister of Romy. We will follow with the Minister of Romy and return at 6.30. Meeting adjourned until 6.30.